call the uh, December 11th school committee meeting to order. Uh, we'll start with public input if there is any. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll have the uh, motion on the is, uh, Actually, does anybody have anything they'd like to take off of the consent agenda? Seeing none, we'll move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. No students tonight? No. No, they weren't able to attend. Mr. Club. Mr. Club. Um, I, we had a Rakasa meeting. Um, I, I was not there. So I guess the only, the important thing that I'm remembering about the Rakasa meeting right at the moment is, and was an um, update after our, our annual meeting, is that they, Rakasa, along with other, the other parts of the public, um, safety organizations are presenting their budgets at Selectman's on Wednesday night. And so members of the Rocasa board were um, also asked to try to attend that. I think it's tomorrow night. No, um, they're doing administration and something else Oh, they're doing a couple night. nights in a row? Okay. And then the public safety is Wednesday. So the Selectman's are different. So, so um, for folks who are interested in the great work that RACASA does in the community and interested in seeing that it continues to stay funded with, um, you know, Erica McNamara, our director, and Julianne D'Angeli says the, um, um, oh gosh, Cal not counselor. Community liaison. And she's the, um, she's a trained social worker. Julianne. Yeah. Julianne D'Angeli. Yeah. And uh, anyway, th those <coughs> are our two key people that are on staff with the town. And so we'll be doing that. Okay. I have a couple. Um, so for CPAC, I'm assuming because Mrs. Wilson was mm -hmm. at the last meeting mm -hmm. and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. She reported. Um, I have, so, sorry? Wasn't that on our, didn't you already report? No, they had another oh. meeting. November oh, 28. okay. And I did get some notes from them, but because I wasn't there, okay. I can read the notes that I was sent. <laughs> Um, that and actually I can attest to the wonderful amazing CPAC tree that they had at the Festival of Trees for the Reading Education Foundation it was um, I wanted to win it <laughs> it was great <laughs> and everybody pitched in for that um, and that the goal of that tree was to raise awareness of special ed as part of the community they formed an um, LLD subcommittee to focus on work with district in evaluating bridge and specialized reading mm -hmm. services. Um, subcommittee has met a couple of times to discuss how best to support the district's efforts, but will wait to reconvene till an L evaluator is hired. Um, and they said that Mrs. Wilson provided them with updates on staffing, which include the new hires, and I won't go into that because you are, they sound very happy about it. <laughs> um, and so that's what I got from those notes. And then um, just an update on the Human Relations Advisory Committee and, and Reading Embraces Diversity had an event on November 29th. Dr. Ornstein came um, and spoke. And um, for those people, thank you very much for the evaluation feedback. Um, it w we had a little trouble with sound in the beginning, um, but we are going to be putting her paper that she presented on the Red and A-Track website so people can read it as well. And then the sound was fixed for the questions and conversation. So if you're interested in that, and the evaluation feedback is being taken in terms of the next planning, um, and there are going to be events coming up. So stay tuned. Um, I also went to the Dickens Fair. I assume that someone else is going to report on that. So it was um, packed, wall to wall people, and I got a lot of my shopping done in time for Hanukkah and Christmas, so I was really appreciative. That's a fundraiser for the Parent Supporting Student Theater, um, and that was last Saturday. And um, just to thank you for, to Jean for planning the school committee tree, which was also 
really nice. The joy of learning. Well, thank you. Which was really important. But a team effort from all of us, so yeah. thanks. Thank you. The, are you, you all set? Oh, actually, and the other thing is um, Dr. Ornstein is coming to Coolidge and Parker soon. This Friday, right? Yeah. I thought she just came. She didn't. No, to came. talk to the kids. Oh. So she's coming to the middle schools to talk to the middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. Wait, about did her you say that is this, this Friday? This Friday. Oh. <laughs> you mentioned uh, at our next meeting, uh, presumably we'll have a full complement of a committee if after that we'll yes. appoint a uh, uh, liaison to the HRAC committee That's at great. that point. Are you also going to need a representative for our CASA? Oh, I'm, well, I'm we, currently... Is, I think we... I we just, I just thought of that. I don't Gary, know Gary, right. I, I don't, I'm did Gary on, resign? Well, Gary Nyan was our school, technically our school committee rep. Well, he rep. can still... He can still be on it. I just... Be I, our I didn't, representative. Yeah. Oh, oh. And I currently am on it, so I can... I'll check with Gary. Yeah. Jean? <clears throat> Um, just some staffing updates. We have, um, as of last Monday, hired Lisa Johnston um, full time as the speech and language pathologist at the high school. So we're very excited about that. Parents are in the process of being notified and plans are being put in place for compensatory services. Um, since she is full time, we're looking at student schedules right now to see if some students might have a study and we can provide some compensatory services when they might have a study hall, depending on their schedule during the school day. Um, and then we're looking at other options for families. Um, so that's very exciting, because um, that has been a long time vacancy. Um, we have also hired T. Rome. T. will be joining us as a team chair for Birch Meadow and Rise Preschool. Um, this is a shared position between Rise and Birch Meadow for just this year only. Um, we are going to keep Jane Finger on board at Wood End for the remainder of this year for some stability and continuity there. Um, so by having T supporting uh, the Rise Preschool as the team chair, not as the preschool director, <coughs> Kelly Bostwick is going to be available to do some support in the student services office to help with our monitoring around our mid-cycle, um, a lot of the reporting that needs to get done. So she um, put in place this summer a system for monitoring and oversight of our out-of-district program, so she's going to continue to do that work of monitoring all the students who are placed out of district um, to make sure we're in compliance with that. She's also going to be um, assisting with um, the oversight of some of our related service staff, so our occupational therapists, our speech and language pathologists, and our physical therapists, and doing some audits of their schedules and service delivery, and really kind of digging deep into that information. Um, we continue to have the vacancy in the BCBA position um, and the school site position at the high school, which we'll talk about when we talk about the budget. Um, the CPAC, as we've discussed, met on November 28th. We reviewed the REF tree as well as discussed the subcommittee and the program review process. Um, some of the parents gave some suggestions of some other um, potential evaluators. At this point, um, what we discussed is I had reached out to Tufts. Um, they seem like our best viable option, but there are some changes happening at Tufts University. Their um, office, their Center for Reading and Literacy is dissolving as of December 31st. Um, so the individuals who work at Tufts are able to do the program review, but it would not be through Tufts University. It would be through a private LLC. So we're just vetting that process um, and making some determinations. But I did share that information with the CPAC and also um, the, the bios on the two individuals, and there seems to be um, positive support for that. Um, the process would involve observations of our bridge program classrooms, a review of student data, and surveys of parents as well as teachers and interviews with our teachers and staff, and then putting together a report and some recommendations. So we're just kind of finalizing that process to make sure we're evaluating the right level and, and looking at um, you know, when to start that process. 
but they did also provide me some additional um, organizations and I did reach out to those organizations and unfortunately um, again resulted in those organizations stating they don't do that type of program with me. Yes. I just have a quick question. So the, um, is it Tia Rome? T, yeah. T, is that, where is the RISE work? Is that here or at what Here. Have? So she will be, she'll be functioning as the team chair for RISE. Team chair for RISE. Mm -hmm. Not the preschool director. Those are, right. kind of different responsibilities. So doing team chair functions for right. RISE. Okay, and, and her work will be here and at Birch Meadow where mm -hmm. we're done? Yes. Which I was confused. Um, she made, most of her work will be here. here. Okay. Yeah. Because it will be working with those students who are initially found eligible. Okay. That's it for me. Greg, I'm all set. I'll do mine later. I got a case. I have a couple of things. Um, I do want to thank the Reading Education Foundation for putting on the Festival of Trees this year. Um, not heard an amount yet, but it looked like a very successful event for grants, and the grant cycle is actually already underway. Uh, the deadline is early January. Mm -hmm. um, this year, for the first time, uh, REF had also put aside funding for professional development of 15000 and uh, the teachers have accessed that and have already used the full amount. So money is being put to, uh, to good use. So I want to thank them for all of their efforts and continuing to help improve um, our, our school district. I do um, have two announcements. The first one is, which you may have seen, um, is that uh, Reading Memorial High School has uh, made the College Board's 8th Annual AP District Honor Roll. It's kind of timely since we are hearing a presentation tonight about AP. Um, so there are 447 school districts across the United States and Canada that received this honor. We are one of 25 in Massachusetts. Uh, to be included on this honor roll, um, you have to increase the number of students participating in AP while also increasing or maintaining the percentage of students earning AP exam scores of three or higher. So I just want to congratulate the high school, high school administration and staff uh, for that honor. We have received this honor multiple times over the last several years. Mm -hmm. I also am pleased to announce that we were part of a group from the SEAM Collaborative, Melrose, North Reading, ourselves, Stoneham, Wakefield, Wilmington, and Woburn, who applied recently for a radar grant from the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Um, the purpose of this grant is to reallocate. Radar is a tool that, a, a tool that's been recently released by the state to help school districts um, use data to uh, reallocate resources um, when you're comparing it to other school districts uh, in a variety of categories. So the grant that we received is $88,900. It's going to be managed by the same consortium. It's going to be primarily a professional development grant that's going to allow us to improve our work in inclusive practices. So the idea is by in improving the our inclusive practices work through training, it is going to reduce um, the, the number of um, students and other resources needed in special education because there'll be more of a general education instructional methods being used in the classroom. So I want to thank SEAM for taking the lead on this and um, we look forward to working with these other school districts and getting the resources to, to move forward in this area. Does, it is very consistent to our what we're doing in our district improvement plan. So does SEAM typically uh, was compete for grants? Mm -hmm. uh, I, would, would they theoretically compete against us if we wanted to go after? So we made the conscious choice. We could have done it individually, but we increased our chances by doing it as a collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, there were some school districts that did do it individually. There were only 10 school districts, I believe, total in the whole Commonwealth that got, well, 10 recipients. SEAM was one of those. Um, so it increased our chances of getting the grant by and doing how, it this How way. do they uh, allocate the, is it uh, by dis, all the districts you named or an even amount, or does everyone come? Uh, no, SEAM is going to provide the professional development, so they're going to use the funding 
And we're going to access the professional so development through SIN. So we have access to all of it, Correct. not just a proportion. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Correct. Great. So those are my reports for tonight. Okay, so uh, the rest of the night we'll have the uh, guidance uh, presentation, and then we'll have a personnel update and a budget update and complete with the uh, second reading of the uh, revised bullying policy. So uh, we're ready. then that includes both other people that had a plan and did not have a plan potentially yes, that number this okay also includes although we didn't have anyone that designated that said that they were going to a gap year program but in general in the past we have that would also include that but that's not the case for last year's class do we uh, I think I, we, we talked about this a little bit last year uh, with the two-year colleges do we is there any way of capturing the, I'd be curious to know whether that's done for financial reasons or other reasons. Uh, so I don't have the definite information for me to give that to you right now. I know that. I guess you know, I'm they're curious they're whether they're planning on move, go, uh, yeah. doing the two year and then going, moving on. Yeah. Uh, I will say that um, the financial reasons is a big part of the conversation mm -hmm. that we're those students who don't want to spend thousands of dollars when they don't exactly know what they want to do. So sometimes they just want to go in, um, take some classes, get their feet wet, um, take some of the classes that they would be taking as gen ed courses at four year schools because it is significantly cheaper. And it's a great option for. Yeah, and there's very good two year yes. colleges yes. that can, you can do yeah. that in.
CSIO rank, GPAs, just kind of looking at how we do things and getting their advice on how we compare to some other students. In addition, um, the guidance counselors all have a goal to get out to see more colleges. Um, so that's um, something that they've been working on. A few of us are um, signed up to do tours. Uh, many colleges do like week-long tours um, where we can see like 15 colleges. And um, the nice part about it is that the colleges pay for the hotels, they pay for our meals, and we get to see all these um, colleges. The difficult part is taking time off from school when we still have everything that's going on, so we're trying to space um, those out. Out of last year's class, 77% stayed in New England, 51% stayed in Massachusetts, 22% went to Massachusetts state schools. These numbers are all relatively the same from the year before before. They were just slightly different, um, but not enough that it was uh, a significant difference. That's 22% um, attended Massachusetts State Massachusetts Schools. Massachusetts State mm -hmm. Schools, yeah. 7% um, um, went to New York, then 16% are outside of New England and New York, and 59% attend, attended their first choice college. This number is based off of students reporting um, by the time they're filling this out, their first choice school might be very different than their first choice school when they were originally applying. So like, it's nice to know that there was 59% that <coughs> feel good about where they're going. Um, it's good information, but it's not, you know, it's kind of like whatever. Well, it could be the first choice of the acceptances. Yes. Right, versus it's all the in first how they interpret the question, right? Yeah. Yes, Jean. Quick question on this one. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> the, the consistency of the percentage of kids who stay regionally close by, mm -hmm. are you comfortable with that? Is that something that you would like to maybe see change? So here's the thing. So I've been doing this for a very long time. And as the years go on, you hear more and more kids who want to stay close to home. And I used to say, go. You know, what other time are you going to live with thousands of other people your age? Go experience the world. Go out there. Um, but then I had kids of my own. I was like, oh, <laughs> 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 you're not going anywhere. I, I do understand where yeah. there are some parents who are still like, go, like, go see the world. And then there are other parents for financial reasons or because they're worried about safety or because more and more kids are struggling socially, emotionally, yeah. and they want them close to home. Mm -hmm. There's a whole variety of different reasons. So I'm, I'm okay with it. Great. Um, just knowing from the students who are on my caseload and the reasons for them staying close by. Um, at the same time, I want students to know all their options. And that's mm -hmm. part of us getting out and um, communicating and talking with more schools and being able to say, we visited this school and we think this would be a good match. Right. Um, so that's part of what we're working on. So, Yes, I'm okay with it. At the same time, if a kid wants to go out, I want the opportunities there for them. That sounds great. Thank you. It's on the next slide. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is the five-year comparison of application data. So the very, this, like, green part, the last one, is last year's class. So you'll see that there was an increase, but also keep in mind that last year's senior class was a very large class. So it's not a surprise that the number of applications jumped up a lot, all right? Um, the number of colleges that they apply to went down wow. slightly different. That's kind of what I reported. Um, well, this one that I reported the last time. The last time, it, the last slide was where they went to school. This is number of colleges that they apply to, so slightly lower. Number of different colleges that overall the student body applied to, so that's like 200 or 300 different colleges, say? Yeah, yeah. What's the average number of applications per student, though? So it's still in that 6 to 10 range, but we have some students that are down, like, with two schools, and then we have some kids that are 15. in that, like, yeah. you know, 15, 18. But the majority of them are in that 6 to 10 range. Have you seen that shift over the last three years? Very much, or um, I, it's been pretty consistent since I've been here. So, okay. Yeah. Um, slightly up with the number accepted. Early decision, re relatively the same, not not too different. Early action went up, but that's also because of the size of the class. 
So um, I will say that um, we were almost pretty close to done with our recommendations and um, submitting transcripts um, November 15th with some more December 1st, and then we have some travelers. But um, we definitely noticed a, sh a uh -huh. huge shift of everyone doing things early. So. Mm -hmm. Which we're looking at, um, do we need to change our timing of things for next year? That's something that we're considering. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Is it, um, is it, though, the early action? Is it like kids are, I, I know that, well, two years ago, four years ago, six years ago, it was at least do one early action because that gets, as a parent, that gets it all done pretty much, at least for one school. And then, you know, then you can build the other ones. Right. Or are you seeing students doing mul mul multiple early action now? So keep in mind, for those of you that don't know, there's a difference between early decision yeah. and early action. So yeah. early decision is the binding, they're only applying to one school early decision. Early action, they can apply to as many schools as they want. Still early, but they don't have to make a decision until much later in the year. Um, so I would say that kids are doing multiple early, early action, action now. Okay. Yeah. Um, just because that's what everybody's doing. You know, there's just if they're in the groove, they with the common app where they're using one application to apply to so many schools, it's very easy to push the button um, for multiple schools. Um, also, UMass Amherst, their early deadline is November 1st. Uh -huh. So with so many students applying to UMass, that also increases um, the numbers, too. All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this because there are things that we can control and there are things that we cannot control in the admissions. And one of the things that we've um, done is looked at um, our college admissions over the last 10 years. Because since I've been here, I, I was continually hearing about, you know, in the past, Reading got, you know, this many students into Harvard and this many students into this Ivy League school. But really, when you look at it, that's, that's before, that's like beyond 10 years ago. Um, we have remained relatively consistent over the last 10 years. Um, and thankfully, we have uh, Courtney Bogarty, who was able to help me look at all of mm -hmm. this data, put the numbers in for me, so we can really take a close look at everything. Um, but it's important to know that college admissions changes all the time, and especially in a 10-year period. There's a huge difference. So these are some of the um, things that, on, from the admission side, what they're taking into consideration. So there's the academic portion, which is the transcript. These are things that, like, we can control with the students and we can advise them. So their transcript, how well they're doing in their classes, the level of classes, their GPA, the decile rank, um, which the decile rank is something that we are taking a look at of like how important that is in the admissions process. And that's something we've been talking to a lot of colleges about and having internal conversations about. Um, then there's the extracurricular activities. Those again are things that students can have a little bit of control over. It's based off of their interests. So are they participating in sports, different clubs? Are they volunteering? Are they working part-time? Do they have family commitments? Like, what are they doing with their life outside of mm -hmm. studying? Um, standardized tests, SATs, <coughs> ACTs. Um, and I'm going to get into the slides in a few minutes about like where we stand as far as like our average in both of those categories, um, as well as um, AP exams too. I don't know why I didn't write that. That was an oversight on my part. Um, and then the subject tests, which are those one hour um, mm -hmm. SATs that are also important. I'll talk about those in a little bit. And then there's the additional information. So there's the essay. So starting um, with this senior class during their junior year, it was the first time that all the juniors worked on the college essay um, their junior year in their English class, which was a tremendous help. Then they got to like work on it a little bit more over the summer, and then senior teachers opened it up during flex block for any um, student that wanted to come get more help on their essay. Because really, junior year, the kids are not fully into the application yeah. process. So it's early, but it gets them started. And so it was so great for me coming into senior year where majority of my seniors had their essay already done. Um, which was great. And then they were just working on the final draft with um, teachers that they, it could be their senior year teacher, but it could also be 
other teachers that they've had in the past that were willing to work with them during class block. Then there's the recommendations from the teachers as well as guidance counselors. Um, some colleges want interviews, um, <coughs> honors and awards. The demonstrated interest has definitely become more of a hot topic. Mm. So we've been, of all the colleges that came to the college fair as well as that have visited us and just us talking on the phone, this demonstrated interest has become more important to especially some of the smaller liberal arts colleges where they can take the time and really like pay attention to the demonstrated interest. And for some schools, they're taking that into consideration in the admissions process. Interestingly, we found out from other schools that they don't necessarily take into consideration in the admissions process, but they do in the financial aid process. So if a college, you know, admits a student, they get their financial aid package, and then the student <coughs> says, this really is my first choice school, but I can't afford it, can you, um, you know, help us out and give us more money? They're going back and looking at demonstrated interest. And if the student has made no contact with either college fairs, visiting, um, returning emails from the colleges or things like that, they're like, it's not really your first choice school. You haven't even been on campus yet. So um, this is something that we're talking to students and definitely making parents aware of that. So can I just clarify that this is um, this is demonstrated interest of the student demonstrating interest in the school. Okay, yes. not like a, a demonstrated interest area. So I, I think that this is something that was dramatically different in 2016 compared to, I had kids graduate in 2012 and 2014, and I think in 2016 is when, I know I feel very much that we were personally impacted by that. And so, um, I don't know, hopefully there's been some progress because I think we struggled with uh, a little bit, you know, how do you convince an 18 or an 18 year old um, that, you know, they need to, and, and whether there's gender differences, you know, whether male students and female students might be more predisposed to demonstrate that interest and, you know, do students look at that as, you know, am, am, I, am I sort of brown nosing? You know, it's just a very interesting thing and you can, and you know, this is where parents have to stop doing it for them. Do you catalog so I know some schools are much more interested in how someone did on their SATs and what their GPA is uh, and the or the ACTs I meant to say. So do you keep track of that so that you can give guidance so, to somebody who's applying to wherever Babson say? Yeah. So what's uh, really so we have Naviance, which I think most of you have heard Naviance has been yeah. around for a very long time. Um, they changed it, and I think it was last year, that now you can go in and look at every school, and it will tell you the importance of all these different, oh. mm -hmm. and it will rank them of what's mm -hmm. most important for those different colleges. So it's a great thing for um, students to be looking at. Um, the other thing about demonstrated interest is um, I went to visit a school, and in the admissions process, if somebody's on the fence, they have a strategy of um, they will email the student um, just a general question, just to see what type of response they, they get from their mm -hmm. writing. Like, especially if they want to know, did this student really write that essay, or did they receive a lot of help, and they want to see um, based off of the email response. So I, we are talking to parents and students all the time of like, Students have to check their email all the time. They need to respond in a timely fashion, and they need to be very careful what they write. <laughs> um, so colleges are using all different strategies. Yeah, so talk a little bit about, this is really good information for parents as well as for students, and at what point do you bring parents into the process, and what kinds of resources do you have, and how has that changed over in recent years? So um, as far as the parents, so um, we have a sophomore parent night, junior parent night, senior parent night. Sophomore parent night, really, we don't do, this is just for guidance, um, is sophomore parent night is just the general information of what we do with guidance, what they should be expecting, um, when the standardized tests are coming up, just kind of giving them information of what they can be looking forward to in the future years. And then junior parent night, um, everything that we're talking to the students about in our seminars, we give the information to the parents. And then Senior Parent Night is really focused on the application process. 
in addition to that, I send out the monthly newsletters. Um, and I know some parents read them and they like memorize them and I'm always surprised what they remember. And then I think other parents just get so many emails and um, some have said that they don't always read them. But <laughs> mine are important. <laughs> um, and then individual <coughs> that we have. So parents can come in and meet with us anytime um, that they're free. Um, what I like to do as far as meeting with parents is I like to meet with the student first mm -hmm. because I think the student's um, voice is so important then bring the parent in with the student and so we can have this conversation. Oftentimes when I bring in the parent, um, before I've met with the student individually, the student just looks to the parent yeah. and answers all the yeah. questions. Like, how do you want me to answer this, Mom? Mom, are you going to answer this? So I like to have their voice first. I think there's yeah. always, um, the website is really, the guidance page on the website always has, you know, everything. So you could yeah. find out the just a follow-up to that. Do we have, for sharing with parents and students, got any Reading-specific statistics, both in terms of you know, what kind of discounts Reading students are getting for schools? There's been a lot in the media about how the sticker price of the school is rarely the full price that every parent pays. And also in terms of acceptance rates or in terms of, you know, do we talk to alumni? I, I don't know how your data gathering would be because it's voluntary, but it would, I think it would be helpful to know hey, here's a, here's a network of students who have gone there in the last two or three years. They volunteered to be a resource for students who are considering it. Do we have any kind of those kind of feedback loops or information gathering for writing specific information? Yes, yeah, so we don't have the financial piece. Um, that's somewhat a little bit hard to get because some families are willing to share, some families are not. So we don't have that specific information. It's more of like if a parent shares with me that this school gave them X amount of money, I store that in my head, I'm easy to, you know, and if I see that there's a trend, when I'm talking to families, I can mention things like that. But I don't have any, like, database or anything specific to financial. Naviance carries a lot of the admissions data that's specific to Reading. So as far as how many students have gotten into certain schools, how many applied, how many got in, how many attended over the last uh, I, I think I keep it to six years, um, even though we've had it for yeah. well over 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, but then outside of that, on our side of Naviance, we can see who actually attended. And so if a family asks me, um, like we had, uh, I recently just had a student who wants to apply to a school in Scotland, while well, I've had a student who applied to that same school, and I made that email connection between them. So we usually mm -hmm. do it just kind of on the side, and there's not a specific database that says, you can contact these students. Um, it's a great idea. It also requires us to make sure that every year we're keeping updated with their contact information and stuff like that. But it's something we can certainly explore. Um, there are a lot of students, when they fill out the senior survey, that say that they're willing to come back because we have an alumni day um, in January, um, which is during the flex block this year, I think January 5th. Uh -huh. So um, we send out invitations to a whole bunch of alumni try to get like 15 to somewhere around 15 that come back and talk to the senior class. But there's a much larger number that say yes, that they would be willing to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. All right, so here's our SAT scores. This is probably the only slide where I'm able to include this year's senior class because they've already taken the SATs. Um, so. I think it's important for you guys to know that between 16 and 17, there's this jump, but that's because the SATs changed. And so the scoring changed. Um, when you look at the comparisons, it's relatively wow. the same. Um, what we're doing this year um, with the help of um, Courtney Cloverty is looking at our standardized test uh, scores. And um, we now have access in College Board to uh, not only our average scores, but how each of our students did in each of the areas. And so we're meeting with department heads, we're talking about how our students are doing, um, specifically on the SATs, but also the EPs, and breaking it down to all the different categories. And our hope is that we find time in our um, schedule that teachers are also looking at this information and then looking at our curriculum and how it all matches. I think it's so important. I don't want teachers to teach to the SATs. I want them to be aware 
and look at how what they have in their curriculum. And if it's, there's a day that says, hey, we've seen that this is on the SATs, like let the kids be more aware of what to expect. And it's not just on the PSATs. So it's been great um, having Courtney help us with this information. Um, and she's also going to help us kind of break it down to levels of classes. So how do our uh, SCP students do on the SATs versus our honors students, um, AP students, and breaking it down as much um, to that level too, which is nice. Um, one thing that I did not include is our average scores for the SAT subject test, and that's something that's just kind of a personal goal of mine, is that I want to increase the number of students who are taking these subject tests for a few reasons. One, I think it helps with college admissions, and um, so subject tests are generally taken at the end of um, the course that they are taking. So if it's biology, most likely they're taking it at the end of their freshman year. Mm -hmm. Chemistry would be end of sophomore year. But our freshmen and sophomores don't know what colleges they're going to apply to. They don't know if they're going to need it for college admissions. But more and more students need it for the Copeland Scholarship. So the Copeland Scholarship mm -hmm. is based off of the MCAS, their MCAS scores. And um, it's, you have to receive, like, I think, one advanced and one proficient um, in the MCAS. If they get that, that means that they qualify to apply. And to qualify to, you know, to actually apply, they have to have two subject tests or two AP scores with a certain score on all of those. Um, and again, these kids don't necessarily know if they're going to qualify because that information doesn't come out until junior year. So I would like us to increase the number of students who are taking these tests. Um, to do that, that's working closely with the teachers. So guidance is giving the same information as the teachers of who we think should be taking these and who, who we think could do well. And also helping teachers know what's on these tests. So what are those, those tests administered? Is, is that at a testing spot or is that something we can do here? So we can't. Well, so that technically changed this year. Generally, it's on a Saturday whenever the SATs are administered. At the same time as the... At the, the same time, but you can't take both right. at the right. same day. So you have to pick one day you would do something <coughs> test, another day you would do the, um, the, just the regular SATs. Woburn does what? I think it's Woburn where Woburn High School tends to be, has been a subject test site. I don't know what date, but that's Yeah, so... Um, my guess is June because we offer them in March and May, but we don't offer them in June, so they might be in June. And June is a typical subject test time. Do, do you let the parents to next question about you know the information that you give to parents? So that's a that's an item that parents need to know early. And unless you have multiple kids, right, you wouldn't, or unless guidance was yeah. telling you, yeah. you wouldn't know that till after the first one. Yeah. I will say. That is feedback that we have received that I think we need to improve on mm -hmm. because we talk about it sophomore parent night, it's in the newsletter, but to be honest with you, it, uh, this is where I'm gonna defend parents. When you're getting too much information and your mind's not in that mode and you might have missed a newsletter or you might have not remembered what you heard, like, you know, early on at a sophomore parent night, they don't necessarily remember. So that is feedback that I've received of um, improving how we're communicating that. So if the teachers are communicating with the, are able to communicate with students to say, you know, you really ought to consider taking right. that subject yeah. test because it's too early, right? At the end of biology, you don't really know, but that's when you need to take that test. Take yeah. So yes. can I just backtrack because I'm feeling like one of those parents right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you said that the COPLEC scholar, I know I'm pronouncing it wrong, scholarship is based yes. off of the MCAS yes. scores. You have to get a certain score on your MCAS in order to qualify, yes. and then you want to take these subject tests so that you can get to the next level to yes. apply for this scholarship. Yes. Subject or AP. And it's either two APs or two subject tests or one of each. Okay. Thank you. And for the APs, um, I think it's like three or higher. Subject tests are usually in that like low 600 to mid 600 range for each mm -hmm. of the subjects. You. But in addition, it's not just Copeland. Like, I think it's important for these kids to have these tests for some of the, our more selective colleges that they're applying to. Yeah. So. Um, there's been an increase in ACTs. Not a surprise because the SATs changed. So it was a natural.
natural um, increase with ACGs. Um, I think, I predict that this number is just going to continue and we're going to be at a place where there's just as many students taking the ACT as they are um, SATs. So this trend is what's happening in just about all the schools. Ask a question about the percent participation in SAT and ACT. So if you go back a slide, so the 327 there, that's out of 348. So that's about 90 some, 93, 93%, 94%. And then it's it's a third of that, right, for the ACT. Yes. Um, and then the scores versus the state average, it's not a linear scoring system, right? right. At least the SAT is not. It's graded on some kind of weird distribution. Yes. So, uh, do you have any, when you look at the scores, both you know, SA, ACT were closer to the average, but I don't know where the median sits. Just what are your impressions of, how, are there any changes in, looking back in the data you have here, about how Reading students are doing on one test or the other relative to the, their percentage or percentile among to peers? To be honest with you, um, majority of students who have taken both are using their SAT scores. Um, there's not a huge difference between the two, to be honest with you, and I think that many students just are so used to SATs, so that's what they're submitting, and you know, because there's not a huge discrepancy between the two, that they're not paying for the ACTs to be set because it's not going to make a difference. We do have some students who have done significantly better on the ACTs, and they are only submitting the ACTs, but it's not enough that it's affecting our Yes. Was the per per participation way down though in 2018 with the 244? What, what was the smaller class? Smaller class. What, oh, the class size. Class size. Yeah, the 348 yeah. was 17. That's this based on like 300. This is the current senior class. Yeah. Current yeah. senior class is 250. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, I didn't know what 17 that. 17 had what? Two, three, it was 340. Three, 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 oh, if you can add that class size to this slide, okay. it would help. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yes. Are you finding, thank you, by the way, for this. Are you finding that you're surprised by students' sto scores? Are they sort of what you're expecting given their record, their academic record? Is that an unfair question? No, that's a very fair question. I don't want to answer. Um, okay, no, sorry. No. Um, I would like to see the scores higher. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny it. I would like to see our scores higher. They're fine. I think some of our top students, um, it would benefit them if their scores were a little bit higher. Um, I think we are, um, our SCP and some of our honors is kind of where I would expect some of our kids who are taking more of the higher level um, classes, that's where I think that we could be doing a better job of um, making sure the teachers know what's on the SATs, preparing them. Um, There are some kids, I want you to know, there are some kids who do phenomenal on the SATs. So um, I just, in general, would like to see an increase. Kind of related to that, um, what kind of analysis do you do relative to peer districts to see how are Reading students matching up against districts that we consider to be comparable? Yes. Um, I do a lot of comparison with the Middlesex Guidance Directors League. Um, so that's where most of my um, comparison is, but that's something that, you know, with um, Pony Poverty, we've looked at other districts and things like that. Um, I think our trends are pretty consistent with other districts. Um, I think we can still increase. So you, <coughs> you mentioned uh, earlier the, the Harvard discussion. Uh, is there any, uh, and you just said you'd like to see the score, is there any coral, correlation with the top IVs or whatever that look more at this than GPA? As far as? At these SAT and yeah. ACT. So here's, here's what's difficult with these, um, you know, the IVs um, in very top tier schools. Um, some schools are looking for that oval player. Some schools are looking for a particular yeah. athlete. So I can't say that it's specific to SATs. That's why I think it doesn't hurt to increase our SATs because that's something that we can kind of control, you know, at least preparing them more. 
I guess I was just curious as you, as I guess the Naviance would tell that story, whether those schools are more interested in GPAs than they are, uh, I mean, uh, test, scores test scores and GPAs. Yeah, test scores are important. Yeah. Their GPAs are important. It's all the other additional stuff that yeah. I think is equally important, and that's where I'd like to see Reading kids spread their wings a little bit and not just volunteer in Reading and not just play sports in Reading, but let's look at what else is out there and that they can kind of spread their wings. I'll be honest with you, though, I want to be careful. There's a whole game that is played with college admissions, and what is expected, used to be expected of college students is now expected of high school kids. What's expected of high school is now in middle school. And so I also just want to keep into consideration that there are some kids who can handle it, and there are other kids. We really need to make sure that they are kids, and we're exactly. allowing them to be kids. But at the same time, I wear this hat of guidance director that I need to make sure that they're staying competitive with everybody else so it's I'm waiting for the bubble to pop in college admissions and they realize that kids need to be kids but it's, we're not there right now I, I think it was um, last year, I mean, you can go online and read all kinds of articles about the co what the colleges are doing with yield and how they manage it, but I think you can look at the Naviance data and you can see the data of students that were um, not accepted to a school and their SAT scores are way over what the target is and their GPA is way over. And it could be that that student did not respond to that email from that or that a school is very much you've got to visit us and that's it and if you don't visit in person the, you know they're the, you're, you're way down on the list and then if you don't respond to that email you didn't visit and then you don't respond to that email it, it might not matter to them what your GPA and SATs were so you can see that even as a like you you don't know who the students are you can see the dots the you can see the, the data so I think it's it's interesting because they're Managing their yield about you know how many how many um, offers they put out and that that good, that gets in U.S. News and World Report and they're rated and ranked on that. Right. So it's really complex. It's very complex, and I've asked that question all the time about you know why didn't so and so get into the school or or what are comparing one kid to another. But there are so many factors mm -hmm. um, that play into it. It's hard I, to I think what's important, though, is that the, ki the kids are, um, you know, once you decide, once they make that decision and say, this was my first choice of, you know, what I now had to choose from, I think it's, you know, watch the support that parents and the community and everything that they, they take with them from Reading to make them successful in that environment. And, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. I think most of the time, it does, and you know, you probably hear from students, and those are the students that come back in January to talk about their positive experience. So, what's nice about um, us having the alumni is that they come and they talk to the senior class, but then they meet with administration and guidance counselors, and so we get a lot of feedback of what they, what classes that they took in high school really prepared them, or what they think um, that they wish that they had, or their friends that their roommates with now um, took this class in college and they wish that they had something. So we've gotten a lot of um, great feedback over the years, which is really nice. Yes. I was, oh. oh, sorry. I was really glad to hear you say both sides of that story and to talk about the, um, the pushing of the kids that what was expected in college is now expected in high school. And what's it, because we hear so often about the pressure the kids are under and it just brought to mind the race to nowhere. And so Mike, when I was hearing you talk about raising the scores and I think it's helpful to know more about what's on the test, but I caution, my, my, I err on the side of caution that there are so many schools to choose from that if we just try to push our kids to do better on the tests, the, the pressure is they need to be happy. Right. And they, when they get there, they're going to find they're not happy, and that's not going to work. Right. 
So I was really glad to hear you say that you're very aware of that and supporting that as well. And so I guess I wanted to repeat it so parents hear that too, because it's not all about test scores or, or going to an Ivy. It's about being happy and finding your, your choice points on the journey and yes. meeting the right people and being in the right environment for you to grow. What I'd like to see with the standardized test scores as far as it increasing is more awareness with the staff who's teaching English and math and you know the different subject tests and stuff for them to be aware of what's on the test. But I don't want it to be in their face, in the kid's face, that it, it becomes this mm -hmm. tense like college. Bit. That tension is already there uh, because it's just what's in society, you know. There is not a there's not a kid who goes into junior year where they meet an adult and they, what, once they hear that they're a junior oh have you started looking at colleges they're even trying to you know like and that that's part of our discussion in the seminars of like how you're handling that stress and the kids are like if one more person asks me where I got into college I'm going to scream like the pressure is just there from society and I think mm -hmm. sometimes people are just trying to have a nice conversation and find a way to connect but the pressure is there but I think that there are ways that as the school system we can be helping improve things without it being so much. Jane? Just to piggyback, um, I just attended an anxiety conference on Friday and there were a series of speakers including uh, the Winchester Public Schools. Um, so we you know, do a good job of getting kids in the top tier schools and they're trying to scale back and it's exactly this conversation, making sure the kids uh, aren't in that race to know where so far, so much that they sort of lose their way in terms of mental health and just the well-rounded. It's got to be a partnership with the parents. We talk frequently about not wanting to uh, overstep into family values. You know, every family has its own set of goals, every set of values. And we just want to make sure that we're providing access and opportunities, but also educating parents when you know it may be too much in a given kid's situation, or it's overstated information that's being kicked around in, you know in social media, and just making sure that everyone has a full the full range of, of, uh, of decision making points um, before they go ahead and you know make a wrong decision. So mm -hmm. we're not alone. My point is very comparable to the two comments that were just shared, so I'll keep it very brief. But more, um, my focus was less on test scores and more on the, we need an oboe player, but you should also have a sport, you should also be on student council, and you should definitely have a part-time job, and volunteer work is really important, and you should be taking a lot of AP classes. I think uh, my focus was less the pressure of the test scores and getting good test scores, but the pressure to be this professional at a very young age, mm -hmm. as opposed to, as my colleague was saying, sort of sorting out who are you and what, right. what do you want to be. Right. Um, so I'm thrilled to hear you're balancing, you know, allowing kids to access as much as they possibly can, but still protect their mental health. So I'm really happy that your voice is in the conversation from that perspective, because I think it's really important. And I, I share your hope that the bubble will burst. I do feel a little bit in the parent community. I think parents are beginning, I think the pendulum swung, and maybe is now coming back a little, so I'm hopeful too. <clears throat> All right, so we talked about the ACT data, so this is AP, so we received this recognition recently. Um, the number of exams went up, and so did the number of AP students, so I apologize, but this is kind of overlapping here. Again, this is, I think, largely due to last year's senior class was large. So therefore, the numbers um, would go up. Um, but you can see that there's a big difference between the number of students who um, took at least one AP um, exam and then the overall number. So there was multiple kids. The majority of kids took more than one exam. Um, it says 207 students uh, received scores of three or higher. So that's really our goal. Um, because that's going to benefit them. The purpose of AP exams, uh, twofold. It started off um, with um, if students got a certain score, they could use that for college credit um, and be exempt from the initial like mm -hmm. intro courses. Um, I will say more recently, it's become more of the admissions game. Um, but there are still plenty of students who are using their scores to um, 
get out of that intro course. And it does help for some students. Um, I know uh, one of my former students was able to graduate early, which saves a ton of money. Now, every college um, looks at SAT scores differently. I mean, AP scores differently. So some of them will accept it for certain majors, but not others. But um, it's a good thing to um, do well on these um, exams. We are strongly encouraging students that if they took the AP course, to take the AP exam uh, because they are, they're prepared for it and it could help them financially later. Um, AP exams are expensive. Yeah. They're now at $100 an exam. So when you have kids who are taking five AP courses, you know, that's $500 that are, that's out of a parent's pocket. And so some students are choosing not to take all of the exams. Um, so I think that's important to know. I think that um, it, just like the, that expense along with the admissions fees themselves, mm -hmm. it's expensive. When you compare it though to the total cost of the yeah. education, and I think you know, being able to shorten the amount of time that a student needs to be in school to achieve the bachelor's degree and save the money is one piece. A lot of students, it also enables them to sort of do the dual degree type programs or um, additional majors. And, um, so it does offer an amazing leverage, and I think it's, I think it's really important that you know we continue to embrace finding pathways for our students to access as many of the AP courses as we offer. Um, so I think. That yeah, the thing that concerns me is that bottom line. So ninety-three. So percent of students with three or higher, which. I don't know, a long time ago, and I remember that being the minimum to get some college credit in some places. Uh, so three out of five. So we went from 93, almost 94% in 2011 down to 80%. That's a big drop, 81%. That's a big drop. And so a couple of questions there, like what's going on? And, and very specifically, for classes where we've collapsed CP and SCP for those subjects, have we seen more kids pushed up into the AP classes or enrolling in those AP classes, performing at below a three when they take the AP exam? I have not, I mean, you chime in to your opinion, but I have not noticed um, a change in AP enrollment due to um, the level collapse. What about performance? So performance, I, so here's what I think is important to know. When you have an increase in the number of students who are taking the exams, you do have students who don't really care about them. Mm -hmm. And they take them because they feel like they have to or they don't want to take our final exam. <laughs> and so there are kids who come in and they put their head down and they're not taking the exam. Um, that does not help us. And so I think that's a conversation that we are having of like, do we strongly encourage everyone to take it or should we just have students who are really serious about taking it? Um, our goal is that we want the majority of students to take it, but we want them to take it seriously in finding that balance. But this doesn't surprise, that bottom line doesn't surprise me so much because um, I'm the coordinator, I see who's taking the exam seriously, and I see who's putting their head down and not necessarily caring so much. I think that that's a lot of where, I really think the parents, that's the dialogue at home. If you're, number one, because you've got to pay for the exam. I have another question about like aid. Like I, I know um, in a district like, I don't know, I, I know kids from Wyndham, New Hampshire, and she, couldn't, they, she, she needed aid, qualified for some aid to take the exam, but only one of the two she had to choose. I just, I think of that, and I really struggled with that because here's a student who really could use that leverage, a low income student, but couldn't access that second test. So for us as parents who are paying for the exam, I assume paying for the exam, now maybe we have some Reading students who are paying their own exam fee. That would be probably fairly unusual. I think it's up to us to raise the bar and the level and let them understand what's, what is at stake here. If you worked hard all year in that AP class, then executing on the test means something to me as a parent because it has a big financial impact for the next four years. But I should, 
you know, so I, I, I appreciate that the teachers and the staff and the guidance counselors are all trying to do this, but if students aren't taking it seriously enough, I really think it's up to the parents and the students to have that, that dialogue. The, I, I'm trying to look at that data too and say, is it, the, is it just a numbers game in terms of the number of st students who are so now participating or the, the number, number, like each student might have only had one or one test in 2011 and now the students are taking four or five tests. Right. So I think that's a factor. I think that we um, probably offer more AP exams now than what we did mm -hmm. in the past. So we look at AP statistics and probably in 2011, I don't know the exact number, but I know the number of students in AP statistics was significantly right. small in right. 2011 compared mm -hmm. to last year when we had 75. Um, you know, the math department head also has the mentality of encourage kids up, you know, and if they want to try an AP class, even if they don't do well on the exam and they do mediocre in the class, the experience of mm -hmm. being in an AP class and the hard work, they're, they're learning so much. So, um, this work may not be exactly where we would want them, but it's a little bit understandable when you're looking at the makeup of Thanks. Um, I'm glad you brought that up because last year, Mr. Bacher and I had a little bit of a philosophical discussion on this exact issue. I think that's an, it's, it's a question to kind of grapple with. Do you want to continually expand kids accessing AP, understanding that you may see a little bit of leveling or even a decline mm -hmm. in kids who achieve that passing score under the circumstances you just said? Mm -hmm. A kid who says, I'm probably not going to score a, five or, or a four or five on AP Calc. But I'm going to take this class, and I know when I go to college and take calculus, mm -hmm. I'm going to be so much better prepared for it. You know, that's a success. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm glad you have your finger on it, and I think it's worth keeping track of. But I, I have to say, because of the increase in participation, um, I'm, if that's what's causing it, I'm very comfortable with it. I'd much rather see a kid challenge. I, I guess I have the same bias as the math department head. I'd rather see a kid challenge themselves um, and experience that, because I think that will have benefit later. Yeah, uh, that's really powerful. The other factor too is we're heavy in the math and science mm -hmm. So there are kids who want AP courses on their transcript for when they apply. And they their strength may not be math and science, but they're taking them um, because they want more um, APs on their transcript. And that's a conversation that we are having that we would ideally like to broaden the uh, AP courses that we offer. Um, there's um, discussion about um, offering AP English language junior year. I would love to see that happen. We've also talked about psychology, government, economics, and what we could um, offer. Really what it comes down to is having the money to be able to offer mm -hmm. these new courses. Um, and so there was a discussion. We need to train teachers with that yes. money. Yeah, so it's the money to train the teachers, but it's also the textbooks and the supplies and things like that. So it, it costs money to do these things, but I do think if we have a wide range of um, AP courses, then we may see a shift in who's taking what. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think in the long run that may help admissions too. Yes. Yeah. The, just a question about how the statistics are captured here. So the 256 total AP students, so if a single student is enrolled in two AP courses, are they counted twice in that 256, or is that really 256 unique people out of 348? That's a lot out of 348. Well, 250 keep out of 350. in mind, it's juniors and seniors. Oh, so it's double that. Yes. Okay, out of 500. Yeah. That makes more yeah. sense. And these are 25%. There's a few sophomores in here, too? There's a yeah. few sophomores. There's a few sophomores. So yeah. maybe 20%, 25% of your given high more upper upperclassmen. Yeah, there's more seniors than juniors and just a handful of sophomores. I don't know the percentage, but... Uh, that 250 out of two grades makes sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. That yeah, just seemed really high. That was all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just want to, I appreciate you bringing that up, Ms. Brown, excuse me, that the, the challenge up philosophy I think is an important one. While we want to see the scores and work closely, I think, with an enhanced data analysis approach with, with Courtney's addition and... Uh, just doing, I think, a closer analysis of the data. It's also making sure that every kid that leaves a high school and you sort of striving for a goal of taking the most challenging course that they can. And, uh, you know, we recognize that sometimes kids need remediation to get to that point, but 
um, those are certainly two goals that should be mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. and, and not to forget that having taken the class, even if you don't score well, and need to take the class as the introductory one at your college, wherever you go, that's a great background with which to start that challenging class. And often the classes at college are larger. And so that can be helpful too. So I, I'm heartened by the conversation about focusing in on enabling kids to challenge themselves and supporting them, not focusing recognizing that it might reflect on us in less positive ways, but that's really not what we're educating our kids for. Right. It's for them. The kids are the most and important one thing. One of the things that we need to figure out, if we have time and we're able to offer more courses, we don't want the same kids just taking now yeah. and taking 12 mm -hmm. right. courses. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's so important for kids to have a well-balanced and they're not overdoing it now just because they have more opportunity. I want them to kind of focus in on what are your interests, but then also have time to have fun and take, you know, an elective that doesn't have like a lot of like homework and just something that can just, if they want to take chorus and that's their outlet, they want to take an art class and that's their outlet and that's what they want to do. I just think that's so important. But offering courses that, you know, say AP Psychology, you know, there are plenty of SCP kids that could be taking AP Psychology and getting the experience. They apply to UMass, that's going to help their GPA, that's going to increase their chances, you know. So just finding that balance for all the different kids. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I know that we used to have AP Art. Do we, we still, still have, have that? Is there an exam associated? They are phenomenal artists. Uh, I I've seen love, them. There's still the exam. And um, I just love collecting their artwork and submitting it because it's phenomenal. They do a really nice job. And they do have an exam in AP art, yeah. too? I mean, it's really a year's work. It's a portfolio. It's oh, a oh, year's oh. worth of work that they are submitting, but there's a date and they call it the exam. But they're submitting it online. It's a portfolio. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that was the last. No, that's not the last slide. I think this is the last slide. Yeah. So this talks about the AP scholars. So this is the number of um, students that we have each year that for AP scholars scored a three plus on three or more exams. And then it goes down to AP scholars with honors, AP mm -hmm. scholars with distinction, and then the national AP scholars. So um, this is where uh, we are. And I also think this is what helped with us getting the recognition. Mm -hmm. Question. I think it's just really hard for our students. Oh, did Jean have a question? It's okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's really hard. My experience is it's very hard to achieve that eight or more with our pathways. Yes. yes. So that's where yes. we need to improve. I think Mrs. Webb said this on an earlier slide, but just a point maybe for the future. I'd love to see a percentage of class. It's a little hard when you're just looking at number of yeah, students because in my head I'm going, how big was that class? And I think you'd see, I think the trend would be a little bit more. So just okay. something for next year. But um, the, the AP, I already said it, but the AP enrollment is very exciting. Very exciting. Great job. Just, Thank you. You should address Ms. Webb's comment about the access to the number of courses. we are looking at the graduation requirements, uh, which kind of segues into the NEAS conversation. But we've been looking at that for a couple of years to bring to this committee. Uh, you know, recommendations around trying to just streamline and open up access so that kids could take more mm -hmm. uh, AP courses and enhance admissions if it's a good fit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Linda. Thank, 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 Thank you so Thank much. You. Hey, everybody. How are we doing? Yeah. Uh, so just wanted to give you an update on, on the ASK process. Uh, last year, about this time, we talked about beginning or uh, resuming that process uh, that was last done in 2003, which is usually a 10 year process. Uh, but as a district, along with some other districts, we decided to hold off and maintain our accreditation, partnered with uh, neighboring communities and superintendents, uh, and, and created some changes in the asset that I think everybody felt much, much better about. It. In terms of it being a more streamlined process, a less expensive process, uh, process that complemented, you know, the, all the challenges and the number of uh, uh, initiatives and responsibilities that schools were charged with. 
with limited budgets or at least uh, cap budgets. So just very, very briefly, just wanted to um, go back to that. Uh, these are the, the reasons we talked about last year, the same obviously this year. The strength of accreditation uh, in many, many, many schools is still an important piece. Not all colleges require it, uh, but a number of the New England colleges uh, certainly it, it strengthens our, uh, our admissions to those schools. Uh, the, other, the other point is really, especially as a newer principal, having a process of self-reflection and having it be a, an inclusive one where all teachers are weighing in, all stakeholders, students and parents, having a chance to kind of see what we can do better and what areas we really should celebrate and be proud of. Um, and again, the process itself has been really streamlined to, uh, to support what is already happening as vehicles of change and of improvement. Um, and hopefully in a lot of areas, it's a chance to recognize everyone's good work um, and look for you know, potential leadership and distributing leadership in schools and giving teachers a chance uh, to play a part in that process. Uh, the timeline is, again, it's a 10-year process. Uh, this process has been shortened a little bit. The self-study uh, in the past would take as long as three years, and now that process is cut down really to kind of a two-year process of self-reflection. Uh, and much of that is actually just working a self-improvement, a, a, a school improvement plan, uh, which they've done a nice job of trying to take that plan that exists and have it, as long as it's aligned to the standards and making the changes that uh, they agree with us on and using that as a tool for the, you know, for the 18 months that they evaluate. So our visit is scheduled at this point um, in December 9, 2020, it will arrive. It's a shorter visit. Um, it doesn't begin with the, the Sunday that some of you may recall, the, the pomp and circumstance, which mm -hmm. uh, was nice, but was also very expensive and, and disruptive in many cases to the, the, the regular business of schools. Uh, but so that's a, that's a that's the date that we have now in the books. So far this year, uh, most importantly, we've created the steering committee and are very, very excited about the composition of that committee. Uh, we have two co-chairs, uh, one from the guidance department, somebody also from the uh, Danielle Jones and Jenna Gopian uh, from the math department. So we've got math and guidance as our co-chairs. And then just about every department represented on the steering committee. Um, and uh, a, a very dynamic and collaborative group. Um, we've also administered the survey. NIESC has developed in the past, it was the Endicott survey. Uh, they've spent quite a bit of time kind of overhauling, developing their own survey. Um, and I think it's 50 schools are beginning to use that tool. One of the advantages is that uh, we're able to administer it several times and the cost is, is neutral. Uh, so you can kind of see the growth over the 18 months or longer uh, to see how, you know, how the stakeholders are feeling about changes that we've tried or if there's things that we'd like to, to take another look at. Uh, so we have sent that out um, to the students. We did that during the day with during school at Flex Block. Uh, we were hopeful that it would work with our, our wireless infrastructure and it did in fact, using BYOD, and I think we had three kids taking it paper form uh, for a variety of reasons, but and then our desktops that in the library. Uh, so we had just about 90% completion and are looking to increase, um, you know, the, the students that were out that day. It was the day before Thanksgiving, so we tried to take what's often, uh, I don't want to say a throwaway day, but a challenging day to get a whole lot of heavy lifting done academically and use that in a way to try and get the survey done. Uh, we also sent out the survey to parents, and at this point, we are hovering around 28%. The, mm -hmm. What they're asking for is 25 I haven't looked at that in the past few days. Uh, we closed the survey on December 8th, so we'll take a look and see if those the percentage has gone up. And Sorry, then, it, was, it was 28%? Yeah, so 25 is what they're shooting for, and so we've, we've at least met that, and, and uh, you know, so hopefully that will continue to climb. And then staff, uh, we did that during a couple of uh, in-service days that we had and, and left it open for staff to take. And at this point, it's close to the 100% mark. Uh, so our committee is going to be looking at that survey data as the first step of the self-reflection process uh, and just trying to see you know, what are the, the different perspectives that folks have in the standards, the five standards that NIASC has uh, set for us. And it's also then the next step is trying to see 
if the evidence is consistent with, with what folks are feeling. So you've got the perspective that each stakeholder has, but then we've got to kind of collect to see, you know, can we substantiate each of those different viewpoints. Um, the schedule we've put together will be using most of the staff meeting time, so one of the three meetings a month throughout the remainder of the year will be des will be dedicated to looking at each of the standards as they're being, each of, we have two people per committee, they're collecting the evidence, they're putting together a short report, which is much more streamlined than it was in the past. It used to be a 10 to 12 page mm -hmm. summary. It's really now two pages. It's less important the format. It's much more of a kind of a down and dirty, how's it going, and, and, and let's really talk about the work. Um, and so in each of those staff meetings, our hope is to provide staff with a summarized report uh, a week in advance uh, to get some feedback. People may have other ideas, other sources of evidence that we've, we've uh, overlooked, and then ultimately to vote on each of those in the self-reflection stages. Uh, We've also been looking at doing the look back. So previous reports, uh, while 03 was the last formal visit, there were several other reports, uh, progress reports that came out of that 03. And, uh, and we're taking a look to see the things that had been started, the ideas that had uh, come out of 03, and some of the work that continues to this day. And it's, and it's a nice way for folks to feel as though, even if it's work that has kind of gone by the wayside, that if there are pieces that we're excited about either resurrecting or things that look similar to what we've started, it's a nice way to validate a lot of the work that was done in the past instead of um, starting from scratch. And then we have our, our meeting with our NIAS liaison, who happens to be the director of NIAS, George Edwards, uh, scheduled for January. They'll spend some time with the steering committee. They'll spend some time with the staff, uh, doing a staff visit, and then the leadership team. So for the remainder of this year, again, we'll be looking at each of the standards. Uh, there are five standards, and, uh, and then within those standards, the foundational elements. So they, they do require kind of a minimum standard for any school, which gives the direction as to whether a school is accredited or not. Um, and then also the areas that we feel like we, we need to work on, continue to develop in those standards. Uh, when the school, when the uh, ESL study team comes out and visits, Maybe in the fall, in October to November uh, range, they'll look to see if their feeling and opinion that we developed as a staff is consistent with their observation in their visit in the early fall. Uh, depending on that finding, if it's if it's hopefully matching their their view, uh, that will govern our self uh, our school improvement plan for the next 18 months afterwards. So they really do give you a chunk of chunk a chunk of time to work on that and. Uh, and make sure that you know, the improvements that we recognize need to happen are actually taking place. So that conference is really only one day, and then there's a second day dedicated to meet with the, the principal, meet with the steering committee, and any other follow-up meetings. But the observation, kind of the disruption of the day, uh, is, is really just limited to that one day. It's typically two to four people from the ask. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then they submit the report back to us as to what next steps they'd like, us to, see, uh, like to see us doing. Uh, and then again, we'll have the 18 months, which will bring us to December of 2020. And that summary report is the final step, which is a much, much more streamlined process. It used to be binders and milk crates of information and portfolios uh, that really required every single staff member to wordsmith and participate in the writing exercise, um, and all PD really kind of came to a grinding halt. Uh, but now that steering committee is really charged with doing the entire process. Um, and the vetting still remains. That's one of the things that's super important, obviously, is the staff uh, still continues to weigh in on how we determine <coughs> ratings, how progress is being made um, in each of the standards. And so the final results will hopefully give us the vision of what they're looking at now is the vision of the graduates. A lot of things that you heard I'm going to talk about. Uh, they're really trying to, to focus the next version, the next vision of the NIAS accreditation on coming up with a vision of the graduate that is not just the skills, but also dispositions, kind of the things that we've talked about in the past, the 21st century uh, learning, 
but really that kids are leaving school being able to apply what they learn, having the, the soft skills that you know will make them marketable in college and the workplace. Um, and so you know they're anxious to see every community has different goals. Uh, they want us to help kind of craft the, the vision as you know, as it meets our own perspective and students. And then after the visit itself, uh, the timeline where before we get a report is much short, much shorter than it used to be. Uh, they're actually going to leave the chair on site as a just a logistical thing in order to make that possible. So six weeks after the visit, the school will get the the feedback and the report, uh, and then we can begin the process of uh, making any changes or if there's a recommendation that remediates certain standards. Uh, to begin that process and, uh, and giving back the, the proper support uh, in the next couple of years in terms of those, those recommendations. Uh, the plan still remains on that timeline of two to four years. So there's a two-year update and then the four-year update, uh, and then eventually you're back on the 10-year uh, visit as we start to prepare for, for the next decennial visit. Yes. Are we technically considered accredited now? Yes. Because we did take a break, but it was we were given the group was given a buy, right? Right. Right. So a lot of those member schools have agreed to kind of have NIA, help NIAS take a look at things. We're continuing their accreditation, so already one more high school continues to be accredited. Thank you. Yes, Nick. What's the role of course offerings and maybe other considerations that they talk at past school committee meetings about physical education or you know graduation requirements and can you help us understand the uh, relevance and kind of overlap between you know we're going to budget season there'll be discussions about you know, I'm sure trade-offs that relate to resources within the school what can you tell us to help us better understand the impact and overlap of those discussions with the NEAS accreditation process? You know, do they look at course offerings? Do they look at, you know, what's a graduation requirement, what's not, percent participation in certain types of activities? Give us a sense of what the relevant benchmarks are. Yeah, the course offerings, they do not prescribe, and they want to be consistent with, obviously, uh, mass core and, and what's being seen in college as being important for a graduate, but they really allow the vision of the graduate to be uh, something that's consistent with the school community. So beyond that minimum of what college is looking for, they just want to see that we thoroughly and thoughtfully engage all the stakeholders, that we've looked at our students, are giving access, making sure that kids are, uh, you know, that there's not certain groups of kids that are given access and others that are left out. So like we talked about with the AP discussion, you know, you may see some of the scores lower, but you're seeing more kids participate. That will be seen very favorably in, in being able to challenge all kids and engage all kids. Uh, but down to the specific course course type, they, they don't require or prescribe. What they do want to see is, and is a requirement, is a written and uh, uh, curriculum and making sure that that's articulated and there's agreement across the course sections. Uh, that's a very important thing and we've already started that process. Um, you know, many, many, many of our courses are already aligned, but. And, uh, and have written curriculum, but there are there are places that we can do a better job, and we're looking at now, even, even now. Can I just follow up on Nick's question a bit? Um, so I guess I was thinking, uh, so they have a set of standards and indicators, right, that the survey is on. So how, again, like how do those, those standards um, overlay, connect to our district improvement plan, like things that we're doing, and maybe I'm not putting this in the right place, but I, I am, I heard, you know, Nick's question about, um, you know, we want to maintain accreditation, mm -hmm. and so there's, um, if there's aspects of the standards that we need to make improvements, and there's an improvement plan that will be developed, um, how does that connect to you know, the district improvement plan, we're about to make some decisions. Well, we're going to make it talk about the budget for next year. Um, and we're going to have to make some difficult decisions. And how do we make sure that we're, n we're not making a decision to cut something that would put 
the accreditation at risk. Mm -hmm. So maybe I, you know, without knowing what those standards are and understanding how they're connected to our district improvement plan and things that are in place. So I, I guess that's what I, we, obviously as we go through the budget process, yeah. like to make sure we understand that. Yeah, and the whole, the self-study guide details every single one of those, uh, the five standards. So the five standards just for the group uh, centers around obviously student learning being first and foremost and then learning culture. Uh, the process of change, capacity building, professional practices, learning support, and then learning resources. So very broad umbrellas. Uh, but within that, everything is detailed in, you know, for each school to try and take a look at uh, how well they're adhering to each of those, those general categories. And we can certainly make sure that the committee has, you know, has that, those resources at hand. Right, so if I think about like learning support, um, I think about our MTSS uh, and our tiered system of tiered supports and things, right? Those are the kinds of things that <laughs> help support that standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just yeah, I mean, some of the foundational elements they talk about intervention strategies, so the MTSS would certainly uh, fall into that, but how this school community defines the intervention strategies uh, and how well we've articulated and how consistent we are across the school those will be the things that the, the NIAS visiting committee wants to see. We get to define based on our mm -hmm. student type, based on our needs, you know, what, what interventions work. So in the past, there was much more, uh, they were much more prescribed about, you know, exactly about what it should look like, whether it was advisory, whether it was heterogeneity, um, whether it was intervention, but they realized that depending on the demographics of the school, it, it can be done a number of ways. Uh, so they maintain the same overall spirit, the principles of those different categories, but allow a lot more autonomy now uh, for the schools to achieve the goals. What did the, uh, maybe this is for Joe, what did the, I know when we suspended this for a while, and maybe that's not the right word, but uh, what was the cost at that point was it like twenty five thousand to to do the full accreditation process in in a year? Yes, when they came for the site visit, that was the expensive year, and, and we, we we pay an annual dues to me ask. So where is that now? Uh, I mean, I, with this whole, it's week, a lot less than twenty five thousand. Okay, and that'll um, be that'll be in a couple of years. I mean, I guess to me. <laughs> The best barometer of how we're doing, we just saw in the last presentation. I mean, I, you know, I, well, I'm not going to comment on this. So, uh, Just some more specific elements that we talked about that they're looking for. Uh, safe environment, again, a very yeah. broad uh, topic, but one that they'll detail and expect that we can show and demonstrate that the students feel safe, that it's a safe environment. Uh, written curriculum, I mentioned the school site itself and plan, which I think was one of the levers that resulted in the building project in 07, was the 03 uh, NIASC visit. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the, the foundational elements that you have to adhere to the standards of minimum um, in each of those five uh, standards. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now we'll have the uh, personnel update. Oh, I do have another question, I'm sorry. Just sure. in terms of, so the follow-up, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just in terms of follow-up to us, will we be getting updates as NIESC goes to the next step? I'm happy to come at any time and give you the updates. Yeah. The next one Sorry. would be, <laughs> what, next fall? Next fall. Yeah, next fall. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Hello. Hey. I'm patient. Um, <laughs> all right, so I'm going to be going over um, our first quarter FY18 personnel uh, report. We uh, have a very different setup than we had, had in the past. Um, last year was the first time we kind of brought these back, I think, in a couple of years. Yes. Um, so we really took some of your feedback, um, you know, and tried to further clarify certain areas and provide some more information and detail in certain areas. Um, so it's much more expansive uh, than previous. So what I want to do is just kind of go through each, each section of it um, briefly. 
uh, and give a little overview and then if you have any clarifying questions we can go through that in each section okay um, so to begin um, we just have a little introduction in the beginning uh, just to highlight we've hired 59 new professional employees uh, this language of professional employees hasn't changed from last year uh, that's inclusive of our teachers administrators paraeducators custodial workers and secretaries uh, so what you won't see here is any of our cafeteria workers daily substitutes long-term substitutes coaches uh, extended day staff um, so that's really what we're keying in on here in the report um, I think from some some feedback that we received from last year was around um, how we were displaying our FTEs for these employees or um, their bi-weekly hours so I think in the past what you had seen is um, those really aren't from a Lisa personnel standpoint how I typically represent in one fashion with just an FTE all around for example a paraeducator more typically um, you know we're referring to their um, hours worked on a bi-weekly basis so what we tried to do with this <coughs> report um, was uh, unify that unit of measurement so you're only going to see our FTEs here for all positions um, and on that first page you're going to see a little key um, for our FTE calculations so what that's showing you is for each of the positions listed um, if you were to be full-time in that role so you're going to see your bi-weekly hours for example our paraeducators 70 hours bi-weekly if you were to work 70 hours bi-weekly as paraeducator we would consider you a 1.0 FTE that would be full-time for that position okay so um, just as an example um, in table one for our newly hired professional employees you'll see a uh, regular education power educator it's the second line for Barrows at a 0.48 so that's why you're not seeing these clean like 0.6.8 as you would maybe with the teacher because um, we're really breaking that down um, and that's rounded to the so that for example would be a 34 by weekly power educator okay so um, table one goes through um, and details all of our newly hired employees um, their date of hire, position they're in, um, FTE, and their school and who they are replacing. And I can, whatever is best for you, I can continue to go through and then if there's anything we need clarified at the end, I'm happy to do so. I know there's sure. a decent amount of new folks on here, so. Sure. Just so, um, sure. can you just, as an example, so yeah. I actually understand it, the um, Stacy Burke, uh, yeah. Special Education Therapeutic Support Program teacher, it says it's a reallocation. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be, I'm about to go through that. Oh, okay, okay. You're one step ahead of me. Um, so what I think we tried to do, or what we did try to do um, this time around was be a little more specific about why these positions were vacant in the district. Um, I think, and we're trying to be, trying to fit everything in a neat little box, which is sometimes hard to do with personnel when you're dealing with people moving in and out of roles. Um, what we're trying to capture, and if you look in table two, are the reasons for these vacancies. Um, so you're going to see some terms used there, like external turnover, internal turnover, new positions, reallocations, um, one year LOA, which is a leave of absence, uh, and a non-renewal. In that paragraph above, we go through and um, mm -hmm. kind of define what those mean for you. So if I can touch on the reallocations, um, we that really consists of restructured positions. So there's a number of ways that we can achieve that, uh, the first being through um, what we are trying to, and we're trying to be consistent about these terms, so moving forward, you're, you're going to hear these a lot more, and we're going to be very consistent about what these are looking like so we can try and stay um, as clear as to why certain positions are open. Uh, but when you're seeing uh, a re that word reallocation, like I said, there's a number of ways that you can we can achieve that, the first being a department reallocation, you'll see, um, or essentially what's happening there is um, we're using... FTEs that are at that school um, and we're restructuring them to possibly make another position um, and or I say make but it's not they're all there it's budgeted it's what we have already in place for FTEs um, 
and I can give you an example of that as we go forward, um, or through a district reallocation of FTEs. So these are all FTEs that are already within the budget uh, that are being essentially restructured um, to meet the needs of the various schools. So these are budget neutral yes. reallocations. And then, as I said, as we go a little further, we talk a little bit more about the restructured positions coming up in Table 4. So, um, Table 3, still on page 3, um, again, represents all of our budgeted positions um, for which a vacancy occurred. Um, so, that's rather straightforward. Sorry, can I just ask? Yep. Um, I just want to be clear. So, Table 2. Yep is referring to the just the data on table one is built on the data in table one or all of the data correct Sorry. from data one okay I'll so and i think and i and i want to if i could jump back to clarify um a few things because i know you're going to see um and this is why it's with personnel we try to, we're trying to fit these in neat boxes but it gets a little um, creative. So you're going to see, I think, reallocation twice, for example, in that first table. Um, that's because, um, for example, if you go to on page two, um, if we could look at um, Barbara Voyer, who we had brought on as the PE health teacher at Parker, right, you're going to see there um, a, a 0.5 position um, within that. So that technically though there was a person that some of that FTE came from, um, a portion of that was also restructured within Parker schools. So we do have a person represented there, uh, but 0.4% of that was a reallocation. So moving forward, it may be helpful for me to note that as well, but that's an, ex so yes, it's pulled from that one table. My long explanation for you. Small question. Right, I guess I, I'm but a little I'm struggling a little bit because I sure. don't see the non renewal. I, I mean, I'm just like, so yep. and I understand, like, maybe we need to be careful about how we yep. yes. put that out yes. there. Correct. So it's got to be, it's, it, there's somewhere in this data, some of these Correct. were, these replacements were non renewals, but it's not explicitly yes, stated exactly. because we cannot Correct. do that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. Yeah, so. Table one, so everybody that was hired. If we added up all the FTEs in table one, would it equal the FTEs in some of these other tables, like table three plus table four? Plus yeah, so table this is five? where it gets and this is where it gets creative <laughs> with personnel and not super neat, but yes. Um, ideally that's what we're so what you'll be seeing. There may be some positions who have a portion of that position was, and I can give an example of that, a portion of that position was, I don't want to get too ahead of it, but um, a portion of that position was budgeted and another portion um, we may have restructured um, or maybe new. So, um, so yes. So table one total, F, there's, no, there's no totals at the bottom of these FTE lists. They're very long. But if we added up all the FTEs in table one, it would equal the FTEs in tables three, four, and five together. Ideally, plus yes. six yeah, or plus six or a six it on be, top. So of you should have your budgeted. No, it's not six because your, six is to be hired. So. Yep, your budgeted, your restructured, which is table four. Should be fifty. Um, and then table 59. five, which is your new position. Should equal fifty nine for table one, right? And then there's, there's of that really only three new positions, right? It's new new yeah. position. Yeah, if you were to go. The rest of it's just. Replacements, and, right? Essentially, yes. Yeah. Have we? F so the only positions that we haven't filled are table six. Correct. Yep. So six plus five plus four should be neutral, right? Plus three should equal the total number in the budget. Yeah, it should be all represented FTEs, which is what we haven't done in the past, which we really, we really tried to segregate out. This is what we had budgeted. This is what we have restructured. And this is what we have new. And yes, there are some overlap, like I said. And, and yeah. so one position may have both. Um, and I can give you an example of that, which may be helpful. Um, for example, um, if we go to table three. Yeah. 
um, if you see our Um, so if you go on, it's page four um, of table three. If you see um, for RMHS, you're going to see a point eight physical so, education teacher. Um, hold on, um, wait. I want to find that. Hold sure, on. Sure, yep. I didn't find it yet. It's so the, so the third from the, from the bottom. bottom. Yep. Okay, yep. You're going to see a point eight high school teacher. Um, the incumbent for that position is currently in a 1.0 position because if you flip to... Um, table five are new positions. You'll see a point two on the fourth line of table five for physical education health teacher at RMHS. That position was increased by point two FTEs that was new, newly added. Uh, point eight of that was already budgeted. So, so people occupy multiple roles in some cases. Or I guess it's more, I mean, in some cases I would say people occupy maybe more, multiple FTEs from different, right. yeah. Right. So they'd have different yeah. descriptors in these tables for the same person could be partly in one row and partly in another row. Correct. And they're paid at whatever rate is applicable to that role for that Correct. percent of their job. Yeah. Um, so in the hopes that that isn't confusing, what we were trying to do was just more really clearly lay out in greater detail mm -hmm. um, how we're, we're making up these positions and roles. Yes. So there's a lot of a lot of detail here, a lot of transparency, which is which is helpful and good. Um, I have a few questions here, yep. but not something that I'm just curious whether you track these things, and otherwise I can submit them in writing, and we can you know, look at these later. I'm just interested in the kind of the takeaways. What what do we learn from this information? You know, what's the context of it? We don't have for you know in this document, although we do have elsewhere the total number of FTEs and FTEs per. You know, within the budget per function, you know. And I'm, I'm kind of curious what we learn from this information about percent turnover among different roles. So what's our percent turnover among teachers, for example, versus paras? Uh, what's our percent turnover for people that have been here less than five years versus more than five years? Um, and then what percent of our teachers have, have been teaching less than five years? And, and how, whatever the answers to those three questions are, how do they compare with recent trends in the last five years? Yeah, I would say I don't have at this point that level of detail. Right. Um, I will say that we do have represented um, on your last page in table six, the reasons for teacher separation. Right. Um, so that's just to, I guess, give a, a greater, we only went into detail for our teachers um, at this point. Because um, I know that I think historically that's what really we had been looking at. Um, but you will see we have broken down, um, at the very least, um, you know, the reasons reported to us for um, separation of our teachers, so that whether that be through their own um, resignation or through um, termination. So I guess follow that up. Helps. Uh, it, it does help. I, I, again, for context, it would be helpful in my thinking to understand how. So these numbers are kind of, they are what they are. I'm more interested in how they compare with Previous, past years. Yeah. And do we have this level of granularity for Thanks. all of our past years? I would say it's th this year the, the greatest. I mean, I w we, we, we just don't have the staffing to do yeah. we, But we we've did only, this year, though. I mean, we did, we did but we don't have the staffing to go back and, and do all of that. No, no, I'm not asking. I'm just asking, do we have the historical data or not? No, we do not. Not to this level, no, yeah. No, we do not. Okay. This was done based upon a lot of the comments and feedback we received yeah. last year to enhance what we were so reporting. Forward, so we right. sort of drew a line in the sand and said, okay, we took a lot of the feedback. How do we incorporate that going forward to be as <coughs> transparent as we could, again, with sort of the similar staffing that we have, but to go back and try to create no, no, no. this so historically. that's not what I was in trying to do. But no, it, I mean, it's a great point. I mean, I would love to have I'm that just myself. <laughs> um, so it's a, new, it's a new dawn of <clears throat> yes. uh, information for us going forward. It's a new benchmark to start you know, in the future. Totally helpful. Thank you. Yes. I, I just want to clarify because, um, so table one yeah. is, it says, as shown in table one, the Brain Public Schools has hired 59 new professional employees. Yeah. So there are 59 from Nicholas Bonifanti to yes. uh, Tia Rome. Yep, Tia Rome. Yep. 
is 59. Correct. And so the FTEs are, I don't know what that adds yeah, up to. Yeah, we don't have the total yeah, cost. Yeah, but it might be helpful yeah. moving forward. So that's yeah. Right. It sounds like that. Okay, I just wanted yeah. to make sure. And then, but then that relates to, I was Nick saying earlier, I just want to make sure I, I understand, yes. is if you add up all the FTEs in Table 3, is that going to be the same as the FTEs in Table 1 or not? I just mm -hmm. so, F, so Table 3 is only representing our representing our budgeted position, so no. Okay. Um, what, in order it has to do that, yeah, yeah, in order to, to do that, we'd be looking at Table 3 um, along table, with Table, table four, 4, our restructured, along with Table 5, our new positions. Okay. Okay. So, so I think just so like 3 and 4 are budgeted. Yes. They just, uh, like four is restructured, but it was budgeted. It mm -hmm. just was budgeted maybe differently, but it was budgeted. The, the new chart is table five. Right. Three, so you would add three, four, four, and five together to get. Right. And the new positions are, uh, right, t new FTEs and the position descriptions is, is, is in table five. And those show up on table one and maybe. It's not just the teachers who are are uh, replacing where it says new. Can you clarify that? So if I looked at table five yep. is the new positions, yep. um, and I don't know how much total FTE that is, but is that that's not limited to those that show up as new in table one? Or is so in table table one is kind of that overall ten thousand foot view of who we brought on. So you may so for example you're going to see in here. I guess if we can pinpoint a position that we've used before, um, our high school. Um, um, so okay, let's. So our high school um, speech language pathologist. So I'll, I can give you another example if this is going to help. That's second from the bottom on yeah. page two of table yeah. one. You see that as a 1.0. Yeah. Um, so if you head to our budgeted positions, you're going to see on page four. Oh, because this was open. Yeah. So if we go and locate our speech language pathologist, so 0.8, you're going to see that as a 0.8 here, because 0.8 of that was budgeted. Though our newly hired employee is stepping into a full-time role, 0.8 of that is budgeted, which you're going to see reflected in our budgeted table. Um, in order to see where the remaining 2.0 has come from, that's a new addition. Um, you're going to go to table 5, our new positions. And you're going to see a point two, yes, RMHS speech, speech language, language pathologist. Mm -hmm. So you kind of can't, I guess, look at table. And this is where we tried to be more expansive. I think in the past we've really only kind of given, in a one, sense, table one. One chart. Um, and I think that, though a little more confusing in the initial, I think this is really going to help to understand more in depth um, where what's making up these roles. Um, so though it does take a little investigative work um, to take a look at a position and see, um, you know, we're, we're representing hiring in that employee at that 1.0, but why? Um, that's because point eight of that was budgeted, point two of that was newly created. Yeah, um, sorry, Jane had it. You got to <laughs> Um, I wanted to thank you for the work that clearly went into this and the effort to really help us understand better. So just thank you for that. Um, I had two questions. One is I noticed under Table 6, two of the open positions are the school psychologist and the BCBA yes. are both part-time positions. Correct. And I'm wondering if you're making a connection between the vacancy and that situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say that that's pretty standard. Um, yeah. I would say... Um, I think to date we've posted, the, for example, the school psychologist position four times this yeah. year. Um, and I would say in speaking with, um, more specifically, um, Adam Blaustein, team chair at the high school, um, who typically in the beginning stages spearheads um, checking into um, and selecting candidates for those roles, um, what he's running into the majority of that time, and I'm sure you can second that, Carolyn, is um, 
that not having that position at that one point rate. Right? Um, that's our yeah. That's yeah, I would say the main reason why we're um, we would have a, that position be declined, and we have had people who um, we've wanted to bring on and. Um, at the 0.6 rate, it's just not something that they could commit to. Same with the BCBA. Yeah. It's yeah. happened a couple of times yeah. with yeah. the BCBA as well. And I do feel, so I do feel that that has budget implications for all of us. You know, yes. I think, you know, budgeting a position because we can afford to pay 0.5, being realistic about is that person out there? And if it needs to be 1.0, if we just can't afford it, we can't afford it. But, um, yeah, I, that, that jumped out at me. were definitely some of the decisions when we saw some of the 0.8s became yeah. 8.1 because we, we just could not fill. Yeah. point A and mm -hmm. a lot of thought and discussion went into how much is it going to actually cost us to bring on the additional point two versus contracting the services out. So there's a lot of discussion between this but when, group. But when you have something at point five, you can't find work to get it to 1.0. Uh, I mean, I can see point eight to, to one, but when you're at... Yeah, point five is tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I just had one follow-up, and I think you've sort of just hit on it. It looks to me like the, I want to put new positions in quotes. Yeah. They're really point two and point mm -hmm. two and point four. Right. So it sounds like they were looking at existing positions and saying, okay, you know, we've got 10 extra thousand dollars. We can make that point eight to 1.0. So that should probably have impact on employee retention, I would think. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. My question was when, uh, an observation and a question, when I was looking at this chart, what popped out at me it was how many special needs positions there are in this chart. And so from listening to what you're talking about and the way that we are trying to use the FTEs to sculpt positions that will bring, and now hearing what Mrs. Dowd said, to bring and hold, keep people here, that that's part of what I'm seeing across these charts is that we needed these needs to be addressed, and I've heard a lot about it through the CPAC. We've, we've needed these needs to be addressed, and so what has been happening is as the opportunity comes, we've been sculpting the positions with sufficient FTEs to get what we need for our students. Right. And, and so across the charts, that's how we, not, it's not extra money, it's it's not finding money, it's navigating what we have available so to bring it budget. together to address the needs of students. And there Am is I? definitely that piece where we wouldn't bring on a 0.5 to a 1.0 if there wasn't the workload right. to do it. So it is that balancing act mm -hmm. of how do we meet the needs within the confines but find the right skill set. So it's, it's a balancing act. Nick? Thank you. Yeah, question about the collection process. Is this yeah. form, very detailed format the format in the ordinary course of business that you collect? In other words, do you have much extra work do you have to do to, to present this in this format? Um, I would say what we are, chart one is pretty standard. Um, it's tracked mainly through um, our requisition spreadsheets when we're posting positions. Um, I usually will enter in who. Um, is the new hire for that role and who's so um, that's usually something that's existing information mm -hmm. um, everything else moving forward um, other than the um, table six yes other than table six um, is yes it's specially is created for this type yes. of thing. okay so I'm, I'm curious just within our committee if people wanted to share if there are you know, in, in the interest of, of being as effective as possible in how we disclose the information, this is fantastically transparent, and I'm, I'm all for the way this is laid out. I find it really helpful. The only thing that I'm missing for me is just a sense of the context. Yeah. And it sounds like we just don't have the past data to provide sure. yeah. the comparison yeah. point. Um, I mean, for me, I had my three questions before. If there, are, if there are ways that we can kind of provide input for what types of takeaway metrics, dashboards, information we're looking for as, as the consumers of this information. I'm wondering if we can together on the, you know, you and Gail and other people working the administrative side, try to maximize the effect for the burden that this all costs time for the administration to pull all this information together and it's, it's really helpful. Um, I'm just wondering if there are other things that the committee is interested in. You know, my three things were percent turnover among teachers, 
percent teachers less than five years experience, percent personnel leaving after five years. Um, and, and we can submit these in writing. It doesn't have to be a memory game, but or it doesn't, I don't want to put anyone on the spot. But I mean, to the extent we can have a dialogue about for next year and as we track this, because you put in a lot of extra time here, it's helpful. But is it hitting the nail on the head and are there ways that we can work together in the future that hit all six of our, well, five seem to be six of us for what our concerns are? Um, so, something to keep that. in mind is that this will be your most dense report this year yeah. <laughs> because no, this, is, this is since May. Yeah. Um, we're hoping that we don't have a very dense report the next quarter because that means people are leaving. Um, so you're going to see less in the next report, actually the rest of the year. So, so uh, what in theory, were, sorry, Nick, what were the three things you? Were oh, for, for me, for me, the things that I'm I'm curious about. First of all, I see I see a lot. It's a so dense report, and there's a lot of there's a lot of people coming and going. So the yeah. first thing for me is just like, is this is this a symptom of something that we should be aware the, of? This is normal, you know, or is this then that's yeah, what no, I'm no, looking this is, for. This is the no it's a big district. The numbers this are is big. Normal. It's just yeah. typical turnover. That's yeah, the first I mean, thing I want to know. Twenty five to thirty ish teachers is a normal is not unusual. So no, so that's the first thing. Got a percent turnover. You know, so first, so what's the percent turnover and percent kind of by function? If we can percent teachers, percent and you know, paraeducators, just what are the, the larger buckets that we collect people in? Um, maybe within special ed versus, I mean, if Gail has a pivot table, she can do an Excel really easily. But I'm really not looking for more information that's not like really readily available. Um, what, what about our teaching core? How junior is our teaching core in Reading? Are, how many? What percent of teachers do we have that are under five years tenure here compared to what information may be readily available out there? Um, and then when we have people leave, are they are people churning through the district at a higher than normal rate uh, at a junior level and then leaving, come in two, three years, go to a training, professional development, and, and then find other opportunities, or, or are they staying? Or are we losing people at the back end at a higher than normal rate where people with 20, 30 years tenure are all, all of a sudden leaving? So that, that kind of context for me is helpful, but I'm, I'm really flexible on how we can get that so that everybody may have their own things that they're interested in. I think it's helpful to know. Well, those. Table 7 gives us everything about why people are leaving. Right. For, this, for this group, it does, right. but, but it kind of, how does that benchmark to what's typical last year, the year before? I, I, I don't have that sense. Right, so this is the raw data. We, but, yeah. Right, we have the total we, overall data, right, for, for yeah. maybe the last two I, I mean, two the years. category, we created more categories this year. We broke it down further for you. Um, we had less categories last year. Chuck? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is just a comment on um, Nick's point. I like all of those metrics, and I would be very interested in them just for me annually. I don't feel like every oh, quarter. Yeah, totally yeah. fine. Yeah. Totally what fine we might be able to do is think of the right time frame yeah. to do it and incorporate that. Yeah. And again, we may be. Oh, Not this is the right general. time frame, <laughs> to, right before yeah. the budget. Yep. Yeah. And then yeah. we can start to say, okay, now we're gathering more of this. It just, there may be a little bit of a lag mm -hmm. as to when we get the full complement of it, but these are good points that we've been trying to listen to all of this and yeah. expand on what we're doing, but then that almost becomes the new watermark that. That's, and that's, and that's exact, exactly what I'm thinking about is are we setting a new high watermark mm -hmm. that you guys feel you have to stay in that treadmill? Yeah. And I want to make sure that the public and, and us as public representatives are getting bang for the buck, right? That we're investing your time, which is our resource uh, as a community. And so to the point that many t you know, of our team members have made at different times in different ways, we just want to make sure that that's the best possible use of all the other things you could do. So I don't, I don't want to create the impression that we always have to go in one direction in terms of creating more administrative work that we want to be flexible. So to the extent we can open a dialogue here, just come to us and say, would it be helpful if, to the extent something's not in the ordinary course of business, or you have a way that, to the extent we can recycle work you already have to do uh, and, and get more use out of it, we want to do that. So come, don't be afraid to come show up, ask Dr. Darty. Maybe we can have a quick, hey, I'm thinking about structuring it A versus B. Would that be helpful to you, or can I just stick with A because that's easier for me? And we'll let you know. No one's shy here. Truth, that will work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so, a lot of work. so much. Really good work. Thank yeah. you both, Gail, too. So taking it to the next level, what we've also put within the packet is the first quarter budget update. So within the packet, we have included the memo and what, and again, very open for thoughts and feedback. This 
the format of the memo in year builds upon what we started to do at the end of last year based upon the feedback, which is to try to present the data um, in a couple of different slices to really give people a sense of where savings may be and where we may have areas where we are exceeding the budget. So this was all done, um, data pulled as of November 17th. So that gave us a really good sense from a personnel standpoint as to where we were because we did have some several payrolls under our belt. We had all of September and all of October. It also, um, so that gives us a very good handle around the headcount standpoint. It also gave us two months from, which will go into a special education standpoint. It will caution that two months is not necessarily a 100% indicator as where we will end mm -hmm. the year because that is an ever evolving in a very ball, I don't want to say volatile, that might not be the dynamic. right word, but yeah. dynamic, thank you very much. That every day I, I feel as if we have a meeting and then we'll, which we'll get into on the special mm -hmm. inside, which is funny but not funny. <laughs> <laughs> to show you just how dynamic it really mm -hmm. and truly yeah. is. So as of right now, Based upon the information we had when we did it, we are looking as if we have about a $348,000 surplus, which comparatively speaking from where we've been in the past is lower than where we have been at this point in the year. Um, and we do have some explanations as to that. So what we've done in the first chart is what we've historically done, which is to give you a sense of what was budgeted, actual <coughs> spend to date, Anything where we've had encumbered, and typically the encumbrances are known external expenses. So if you look at the special ed, that tends to be the known transportation, out of district, tuitions, any consultative services that are known. We do not encumber payroll, so that is more into the projected remaining balance. Would be mm -hmm. any items where we don't necessarily have an invoice in hand, but we have anticipated expenses. So we have broken that out by cost center to give you a sense of where we're looking at from that standpoint. What we have gone away from is the actual school by school. What we've realized is that they are in control of their building-based budgets, which we monitor very closely with them. But what tends to happen from when we budget if you think we actually did this budget last year at this time, we were getting ready to present it. So much can change from a staffing, whether needs change between buildings where we're moving positions, where we tend to spend a lot of time explaining bodies moving and not necessarily where the savings are. So we've rolled it up a little bit to give mm -hmm. some context to that. Then what we have done is we've added the two tables like we did at year end to say where the savings and or deficits are coming from. So we have, and this is sort of district wide, the salary savings are across special ed, administration, regular day, and all of the cost centers. And that reflects hiring. It also reflects anywhere where we have positions that have remained open right now, those are salary savings, even though they're being offset somewhere else from a cost standpoint. Also instances where we may have restructured, where we had a budgeted position, one example would be the literacy coach was a budgeted position that we are not filling, we are going to use that money for professional development. Um, so that, and anywhere where we may have had unpaid leaves of absence. And then we've also shown areas where from an expense standpoint, we are higher than we had anticipated. So that is a combination of areas within special education, which we will talk about. We've had increases in our out of district transportation. And really that is a result of an increase in the number of students. Again, we do the budget in the November, December timeframe. So really we're solidifying our numbers in November to pull together all of the presentations to do in January. So since then we've had 20 students go out of district from when we originally budgeted these numbers. From yeah, I, when, as you step through this, I just want yep. to make sure. So you're on um, Oh, page I'm on two. page two, the, um, the top summary part. by expense categories yeah. okay. where we have I the just want to make sure special we're all education. following. Okay. Yes. 
So what we've had is an increase in transportation, which is due to partly an increase in, mainly an increase in the number of students, but what can also happen in there, and I will look to Mrs. Wilson. You want me to add a little bit me of and I that. go astray. Yeah. It can be a combination of specialized transportation such that a student needs their own transportation. We may have students, and I will not get into but, yeah, individual yeah, detail. Yeah. This is 10,000 foot view. Also instances in which a monitor may be needed. Mm -hmm. The other part is we utilize SEAM. We are part of the collaborative where they provide our special education transportation. That works such that the more students you have on a bus, the lower your rate. So if we have a student who may be the only student going to a particular placement, we pay for the full cost mm -hmm. of that. If we have multiple students, the cost per rider goes mm -hmm. down. Or mm -hmm. if there are other districts that are getting picked up along the way, the cost mm -hmm. can go down. So this is a very fluid mm -hmm. number where each month we receive invoices and the rates can change depending upon the route, the number of students, um, any specialized needs that we have. So that's a number we monitor mm -hmm. very closely. I throw my pencil. Um, we have been fortunate on the tuition side. I know one of the questions may be if you have a transportation deficit, how are you doing on the tuition? As we talked about last year, we were very we were fortunate that we were able to prepay tuitions. We are not able to prepay tuition. So we have instances where we were able to prepay about $270,000 of current year tuition with prior year money. The other part that benefited us is in June, we found out that our circuit breaker, the final reimbursement, came in higher than anticipated. So each year they set a rate. It may be 70%. The ultimate reimbursement may be 71 or 72%. So our circuit breaker amount went up by about $42,000. Mm -hmm. So that is also benefiting us this year because we use prior year circuit breaker so in the current we year. can't prepay transportation no. just tuition no, just, no, tuition. just tuition yeah. is there any movement for that at, at the <laughs> at your it's only at three the months, right? uh, yeah. you know the what right, you, right. your your association the is about reimbursement around transportation yeah. versus yeah. Yeah. i would add the other piece around our tuition line is that we some of the students who have gone out of district since the last budget we did somewhat anticipate students would go out so some of those were built into the, the budget, budget we developed so I don't want it to be that we didn't budget for any of those students yeah. mm -hmm. you know some of them were students we kind of had a sense might be moving towards going out of district based on their teams or other things that were happening so um, some of those are in there we also looked at historical so we looked at on average about how many students over the last few years were going out of district um, and built some cushion in there so that's where the tuition piece um, and we we looked at that from a transportation I think mm -hmm. this year we have just seen a lot more more specialized specialized that we mm -hmm. could not have foreseen right 12 plus and months. we as Gail mentioned we don't shop around so some of our neighboring districts who have just a different clerical level of clerical support are able to shop around outside of the seam collaborative to other potential vendors um, to maybe get a better price for a student who might be you know the only one through seam that's going on um, um, a certain you know to a certain school so we just don't have the bandwidth to do that type of um, reaching out to vendors and, and and getting that sort of better price or you know shopping so we really rely on seam because it does from a time standpoint it takes away a lot of our time it's much more turnkey if we know um, we we're have able student. to you know send the paperwork get a student on a van and and really the turnaround it's quite mm -hmm. quick so um, from a, a time perspective it it is a savings for us but you know, just to know the pros and cons and, and being truly transparent about it. I think, you know, some as Gail mentioned, some of our students because maybe there's not another student in the catchment area who's going to that placement, it could be more expensive um, to transport that. And, you know, the other piece that we've been running into is we do have other issues with the monitor, students who require a monitor, so that's an added expense. Uh, we do have students who also sometimes participate in extracurricular activities in their school they're attending, so there may be 
um, fees for late runs, um, or um, some of our students also have Saturday school, so those are additional costs um, that we do um, pay for on the transportation side. And part of some of the other additional expenses are, which we have talked about where we have had staff vacancies, so I have a salary savings up above. We are, we have seen an increase in our consultative and our tutoring services right. because right. we have had instances in which positions mm -hmm. have stayed open. So even some of them, the psychologist mm -hmm. position that is open in regular day in the high school, we are backfilling that by outsourcing it service. through contract services in special education. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mm -hmm. movement between the right. two as we're doing what we need to do to meet Students. the yeah. needs of the student yeah. needs and what's in the IEP. What we've also added um, is right now an estimate for any of the services we need to provide based upon the OCR, we have an estimate in here we don't definitively know yet, but we are trying to build in items that we know may transpire. Carolyn, you made it interesting. So mm -hmm. when you just said uh, we don't shop around, mm -hmm. and I, I, yep. that, I understand why, yeah. but are we, are, we, are we missing an opportunity or, or is that it's something? Because it, our it, 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 pros and cons. It, it depends. Yeah. It depends on this on on what seeing does provide us some cost savings mm -hmm. on most transportation, but it's the more singletons that mm -hmm. we would save oh. if we were able to to have the time to shop. So around. it's not something where, you know, that person that does that could be have nothing to do for. A, period of time because oh, we can we, always find things well <laughs> I, I mean I guess I'm just, it's <laughs> kind of hard to structure yeah. that to yeah. have some yeah. of those conversations right. as well again it is somewhat specialized and mm -hmm. we need to be very careful that yeah. to the extent we do shop it around sounds very mm -hmm. that we right. are going with reputable we're right. no no I understand right. I think we have that, to remember the other side of that yeah. and, and those of you who have been on the committee know some of the struggles we had with transportation yeah. and one of the advantages of dealing with one vendor is the ability for me to be able to address those concerns they're very responsive I mean so having to vet different companies um, can get very challenging and also looking at training um, some of our students require very specialized transportation and when you know needs arise NRT is a very responsive um, company from my perspective um, you know I can say today I had an issue I sent an email I got a call back from the terminal manager within 15 minutes resolving the issue and wa walking through what the plan was going to be moving forward and apologizing for something that happened as a result of a substitute being there so you know they're responsive um, so there are you know we have to really weigh that piece because there is the management of each of those contracts and right. the relationships with each of those vendors if there is an issue uh, with one of our students being transported I mean transportation is something we're putting we're putting children in, in vehicles and so we want to make sure that whoever we're working with is a company that we're gonna feel comfortable that they're safe that they're reliable that they do the proper training and screening of those bus drivers that their vehicles are safe so there are a lot of advantages to what we do get through this contract and there's a lot of safety features that we're able to get um, through the contract including um, we have video um, on all the vans so we're able to pull video when we need to they have GPS monitoring I can pull GPS reports so there's pros and cons but I just want to make sure the committee's aware that you know there may be instances where it does cost us more to transport a student um, but that could change next month right, mm -hmm. um, right. so well, you could end up and with we are I'm reaching out to other districts to see how do they if they're not if they're using scene plus others what, what is the approach how did they get it mm -hmm. up and running how is it staffed how do they monitor it so we mm -hmm. but you could have tomorrow some another student could in mm -hmm. the catchment could from a different district could mm -hmm. require transportation to the same place and then yes. that's and then that that cost goes yeah. cost down. Right. So <laughs> so right. you know, so our projections is, are based on what we we knew as of, of the first few months. Right. And, right. It, and it we changes. have a few of these singleton types yes. where mm -hmm. we're yeah. the only yeah. one in yeah. the catchment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Great. I think oh, this might happen. Just a quick question for Carolyn and then went back to Gail on the memo, but 
Is, is 20 students a big number for a jump that mm -hmm. we, we didn't have in our original yep. projections? Yep. And can you speak a little bit about if it is being a little where did that come from? Is, is there it's a, a variety of different yeah. factors. We've been spending some time looking at the students because as we go through the process, you know, it's a very busy time and you don't really think about each one. So we've been reflecting on that number and really looking at it. Um, we definitely have an increase in social emotional needs um, and meeting the needs of students who have mental illness. Um, and how do we support those students? So that's definitely something that we've been looking at. It is higher than we would have projected the number to be. What, what percent of that 20 are new kids that weren't in a, weren't the district in. before they were sent out of district? That weren't enrolled in Reading? Mm -hmm. Well, all of them reside in Reading. So, so, they were, so they were all within the district when you made your original projections for the number of students going out of district, and then they were, after the projection was made, they moved out of district. They were not students who moved to Reading during the year and required out of district placement. I'd have to really look at or that. Really I, don't, I just don't have the list in front of me, so I don't want to answer. Okay. So you're asking if there were any move-ins during the school year. Well, what, what percent of students were already enrolled in Reading receiving special education services and then had to be sent out of district in a non-projected way? They were here. Mm -hmm. We you know, had worked with that student before. We didn't expect them to go out of district, but they needed to go out of district. Why? As opposed to new students moving into the district, mm -hmm. that's truly unpredictable. Yeah. You can't predict that. New students enrolling mm -hmm. at any age, but yeah. I'm just curious, was it 18 out of 20? Was it two out of 20 that we had the student in our system? They were receiving special education services. We didn't expect them to have to go out of district. But they, they did. They could, a student could also have not been receiving special education mm -hmm. services and experienced a particular trauma or something that mm -hmm. requires that. So they No, really but that's, that's not my question. It's a question of the number of kids who are already enrolled in, as special education students. So you're looking at how many have already, were already receiving services. Correct. And then, at, and then there was a determination that they needed to go out of district. Right. So, so one thing we've talked about, for example, was that some of these positions didn't get filled. Mm -hmm. Right, and so what I'm trying to think about what is the impact of not filling a position if we design it as a 0.8 and mm -hmm. it, you know, it doesn't get filled as opposed mm -hmm. to a 1.0, suddenly we incur these additional costs. We've talked about assessing students' number of, you know, when we do assessments of students about a year ago mm -hmm. in January, we had a whole meeting on this, mm -hmm. right? So that assessment process, are we, do, we, do we have the resources we need to be able to assess and project the district's needs for providing in-district and out-of-district? Are we building the right programs mm -hmm. to serve our students in the right ways? It just strikes me that there's a big jump in out-of-district mm -hmm. among students that were already within our social, I'm um, sorry, special ed uh, services. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't me say that they were all I, I don't know. In. Yeah, I, mean, so I wouldn't say case, they were I'd all already in. You know, okay. so. right. I'm actually going to ask a similar question in a slightly different mm -hmm. way, and you started to yeah. answer it when you mentioned social emotional needs. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, of the 20, because it does seem like a large mm -hmm. number, without going yeah. into any detail or specifics, yeah. are you seeing any trends? So one is social emotional. Mm -hmm. My question is, um, was there a spike in kids entering the Rise Preschool with b bigger needs mm -hmm. than we've seen in the past? Is it predominantly elementary? Is it predominantly one type of need? So I'm just wondering if you've seen any trends. Right, so in looking at it, um, we had needs across the district. Okay. So I don't want to say it wasn't, you know, Every level was impacted. Okay. Um, I would say the majority of our needs were social emotional at the high school age, Thank and you. then that's an area where you know we had some some struggles. And we have been discussing that mm -hmm. in putting this together, working um, with with Jen, with with Carolyn, with the team chairs mm -hmm. to look at to to Nick's point. The positions that we have, the structure of the positions that mm -hmm. we have, we've been having a lot of discussions as to are they the right mm -hmm. fit, the right mix, not just the 0 0.8 versus a 1.0, but is it the right credential? Po is position, it a, credentials? Do yeah. we need to a think? different type of person? There's different types yeah. of personnel that could address social mm -hmm. emotional issues. Do yeah. we have the it's right? The but yeah. right yeah. as we sit here right now, you can't identify what positions are missing to reduce that 
one. No, it's hard to say one. You, it's hard to pinpoint one sure. piece because it's not really. We have to make sure that it, yeah. it's not just dependent on a part, soul. Part of our hesitation of not discussing this is that there's specific okay. students and mm -hmm. I there's more yeah, factors that contribute right. to the social sure. emotional right. that yeah. that we can't get into right. and Absolutely. I think that's why our right. that's why you're hearing us hesitate cautious right. to not you know identify information I think overall what I will say one of the things today I just was able to do is we do have a new behavioral health coach Lauren Sabella and one of the tasks she's been really working on is our therapeutic program at the high school and she spent a significant amount of time observing she's interviewed all the staff she's interviewed students and she has some recommendations that today we were discussing about how to make some shifts um, we do actually have a vacancy in that position as, right. in that program as well that a new vacancy so um, that may be an opportunity to do so but to one of the other areas from the staffing not that's a great mm -hmm. segue but we, we do constantly assess the rise preschool. Mm -hmm. We'll say that okay. is also another mm -hmm. the reason. Yeah, we so just, we met last week to go over this. We did, we do have, as of Friday, mm -hmm. we knew we were going to have a certain number of students coming in based upon when they turn three. three. Mm -hmm. Correct me yeah. if I do yeah. my ages wrong, yeah. when they hit right. three. So in January, we, we are, it, what's included in here and in the notes that we are adding a new sub-separate classroom at Woodend. So we are adding one teacher in one power. This was as of Friday, Friday. afternoon, Friday. I want to say 4 o'clock Friday afternoon. Noon on Saturday, we received an email saying that in addition to those five students, there are four more. That, that will be joining us. Through child finds, through... Consultation, early intervention. Early mm -hmm. intervention. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There are another four that are coming in. So we met this, this morning. morning, and based upon that, we do know that based upon, and again, I don't want to go too far, but based upon some space. of the needs, we right yeah, now that, we have yeah. that's we're we're looking at that right now. We have the space. We have a plan in place mm -hmm. to move things around. Um, but we will. We are actually now looking as if we need to add one teacher and three paras. So that is a very fluid item that mm -hmm. we we don't necessarily have all of that data. Preschool is the most difficult yep. to budget for because a lot of times we don't know about them until a few months before they turn three. We mm -hmm. hope that early intervention and families will let us know between six and eight months before the child will turn three, but we, we, we can't rely on that and um, so um, Kelly Boswick has been working really closely with early intervention so she was able to get us some some projection and some data that might help us kind of nail this down this year a little as bit well more. as for next year because right. we're also thinking this is not necessarily this is going to be built on year FY this will right. be built into yeah. mm -hmm. FY19 because there's also we tend to look to say if we add them mm -hmm. I want to say it's a bubble that sounds like right. they're not a personal thing but oftentimes if we have X number of students coming in do we also have a, a group, group that will be moving right. out but we know this group is exceeding the group that's moving out into mm -hmm. kindergarten so we know that at least for the next two years mm -hmm. we will we will have this so mm -hmm. which is why I say we did this up sent it out and then less than 12 hours later yeah. We had we a new set of data, so it's it's an ever evolving, and we we do challenge to say can we move things, recycle, but we have to make sure the staffing is right for the needs. Um, I have a budget question on this. So I think I understand why tuition isn't out of whack. It's because we prepaid, but the yes. transportation wasn't. So that's where we're seeing the deficit. So for next year's budget. Should we see an increase in circuit breaker to help mitigate the cost of so these tuitions? So next year, the year. No. no. <laughs> right. Um, so next year we already know fact certain what circuit breaker is, and it is about $200,000 decrease from what circuit breaker is this year, and that is it's $202,000 less than we received. So we do use this year's circuit breaker for next year because it gives us fact certain. That is not due to the amount of claims we have. That is due to the reimbursement, reimbursement which got cut to 65. 
the state oh, reimbursement. So the state oh, seventy or seventy one. No, um, not the state aid. This is the separate circuit breaker. This grant. is a grant. This is a grant. Uh, where essentially, you submit all of your claims, and they look at the total amount. Typically, it's reimbursed around seventy to seventy-two oh. percent. They've come out and said next year it's at sixty-five percent. So it's not tied to what we've done. The decrease is funding. Funding at the state. There, level. there is a way to look for extraordinary relief, which is a very lengthy process to go through, which we've already discussed state moving forward to try to see if we can get any yeah. additional reimbursement. <coughs> so there should be an increase next year in this intuitions. Yes. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what we do, because we it's have build the ability on the yes. to prepay, the other part, too, is we we were able to prepay last year. Right now, based upon where we are currently, we are not projecting an ability to prepay anything this year to help offset next year. We right now are within a couple of thousand of what we had budgeted for tuition. So right now, we're not anticipating being able to prepay. So we sort of have a double-edged sword next year. Linda? So, so uh, thank you. Ms. Brasky, because that was my question about tuition, because we went into that when we were talking about our budget woes from last year, and we, um, part of the problem was informing parents ahead of time about the budget increase, the tuition increase to anticipate, so oh, I guess. About rise that's right. Rise. Right, okay. but, but we have these nine new uh, without going specific. Right, but I understand those students aren't paying They're tuition. Not paying. They're not paying. Right, but the 50% of the children that are in that program are paying tuition, and the whole... What they would... would in is, that revolving yeah, account, yeah. everybody contributes, not everybody. Just the students yeah. that yes. are not receiving You're services. You're not adding typical kids. Mm -hmm. Typical students pay tuition. Right, but we're not adding any into this classroom. Right. No, this, this is, no, this is, this is a sub-separate so classroom. there's no oh. offset to be right. taken for these additional students. So it's decided according to the specific subset, not according to the school, the RISE program. So tuition for the RISE program can't compensate for the additional charges. No. We, we cannot the use the revolving account to offset the cost of these students. We cannot. No. They are not paying into it, so we cannot take. And this is what out we're required to yeah. for them because the needs require yes. this subset yes. classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's good. Yes. So maybe we're going here, but page three. Yes. I'm not jumping the gun here. Uh, it's a good five. good Let's overview. See. I just have two just yeah. two requests mm -hmm. for. First, for the special education paragraph, the third one, where you kind of summarize at a high level the um, additional costs. Could, as a follow-up, if it, it looked like from our brief conversation earlier that, that this is easy to do and already done, um, from, from what is already available and already prepared uh, in MUNIS format, as I understand it, if you could provide the public with the breakdown of what that 222,952 is. I think about 215K of it was transportation, so that really is. We That's have efficiently point. spent our conversation on yes. the majority of that amount. Yeah. Uh, but some people may be interested in, and I know I was when I walked in here, kind of how those items break up to the extent you already have it. And the same thing for the Administrative Costs uh, Center one. We haven't talked about that yet. I don't know if the you want to talk to The Administrative Cost Center is basically attributable to three items. One. Um, is the tax sheltered annuity accounts for the teachers, which is collective bargaining. It's within their agreement. So there is a certain dollar amount that is matched if they make a contribution to a tax sheltered annuity. Um, we did see an increase of 60 people Dollars this year. People. So it is, a, it is a great thing. So we have done a lot of <laughs> outreach okay. to teachers to educate them on the value of yeah. setting up a tax sheltered great. annuity. So that is one of those that great job outreach yeah. of educating them. Down Who did the outreach? Was it? Uh, it was. It was RTA. Was it? Yeah. yeah. So RTA did the yeah. outreach. It, it's a great thing to educate people on the value of saving for your retirement. So this is what I would 
see as a good downside. So but the expense is the seventy-three thousand, but in the forty-nine thousand is some so of the administrative effort required yes. to so handle that. So part of it is we right. are adding, we are requesting um, that we had talked about earlier in the year to bring on some additional help within the the central office to help with the workload since we do not have that extra business assistant position. So we are through a combination of additional overtime hours as well as looking to bring in external help. Is that time and hours internal, external already spent or is no, that No, it requested? has not been spent no, yet. We, we have not spent it because we wanted just to a see request. if we could it's a request. request right. a transfer. The other part that based upon another good thing is we have been doing, I give Jen a lot of credit, tremendous amount of effort bringing in substitute teachers because we do hear that we don't necessarily always have. So as part of that, they do have to go through the health screening. Employee physicals. Employee physicals. So that is a cost per substitute. So we are actually projected to go over what we had budgeted again um, because we are really doing a lot of effort to bring in a healthy pool of substitute teachers so it's a combination of those three items but we have not um, the TSA the tax sheltered annuity that is a that amount has already been paid because we do that in December of each year the employee physicals where we're gauging how many we might need the external help we have not done anything on that yet because we wanted to obtain approval to do a transfer before we move forward with looking to bring External right. resources. So we have in. two tr motions for two different trips. So we have, I understand. which is why we broke it out. One to do special education. I will. Um, so Carolyn and I, when we went through this, this is based upon what we know today for special education. This is a very fluid number. This is best information today. So whether it's it's more or less than that, we will keep the committee updated as we progress throughout. The year, but in the other one would be if approved, we would then look to start to get some external help. Mm -hmm. So that's why we broke out the two amounts. And we're about halfway through. So when you say deficit, it's you do you take a straight line projection of if we have this much to get from you know July first to June thirtieth, and then we're assuming during the school year we're spending at a steady rate, or do you actually have for a more nuanced part model? For the well, when you when you so all of these deficits are based on, you're it, not you're not out of money, right? You have forty one million dollars to start. We're with. Not, you're not out, out of, of money. money. That's not it's what this means. No, right? no. Now, to it, be it's clear, it's just not in the right place. We're reallocating the funds based salary. on the projections. The salaries you have. are a straight line. Yeah. The salaries, salaries are, are straight, straight line. Others. But but I'm saying based on the projections that you have for the second half of the year, if those hold true. That's when you're saying, I just want people to be clear that it's we're not running out of money here. There's no. plenty no. of money. No. Uh, we're just looking, we're not no, even we asking for this, more money. We do we're this all the time. I get we're it, I get it. No, nope, we definitely, as of right now, are projected to have additional funding at the end of the year based upon what we know today. It's we have, We're not looking to go negative in total. It's no, just they're not in the right And you're typically buckets. within 1% or less yes, of your right projections. Yes, right now we're within So right now it's 0.8. Right. Yeah. So again, it's more what we want to be able to do is do the transfer now, especially into special education, so that we do not run into an instance where we have the total pools available, but we need school committee approval to get it to into the right cost. To move it between costs. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that we can continue to pay the invoices. Yes. So my question is about that second the second point, the additional help. Um, I really would love not to throw money at temporary help if the amount of money would be better spent over time by having an additional person that could take on the needs as they arise and be there to help so that they don't have to, the new person doesn't have to relearn the system. There's not training involved, which takes time. So and those are discussions we wanted to have as part of the budget. Yeah, we're not in a position we, to do make that type of decision. Right. We're, we're going to come to the committee with a proposal uh, for FY19, and that yeah. will include which is, what yeah. this additional which help is consistent looks like. with what we've been saying all along that we wanted some funding for temporary help, um, and we would come back in FY19 for a. Yeah. Uh, right. For a position. Different solutions. We're, we're just, right. 
what we're being asked to do tonight is make a budget transfers yeah. based on some budgets that are that are under and all. we do this we do this yes. every year. usually do this twice a year yes. usually do it now and usually do it at the end of the year and we want it to be very transparent with the administration right. to say it is there are two known items based upon increased participation right. and then one is to say if additional funding were transferred we could look to right if i, I bring in additional this, help right. for on a temporary basis right and this for is the rest of the we year. talked about this some months ago mm -hmm. and i believe it was you know mr bobbin who suggested is there an opportunity for us to handle any of this with some temporary resources mm -hmm. and it and so that's where we are this year yes. and we wanted um, to make sure we had it available so that's why we thought it would make sense to wait until we did a projection yeah. to say do we have the means so so do you want me to put a motion sure i'll i'll put the motion move to approve the transfer of two hundred seventy thousand to the special education cost center from the regular day cost center second is there any further questions discussion i uh, just a comment i mean yes. it's mandated yeah. Special education. Well, th this is being driven by federally mandated costs that we have to incur. We have to pay this. Uh, to me, this isn't a discretionary thing. We have to meet the IEPs. That's right. the mandate. And if the IEP I calls for specialized transportation to an out of district placement, then yes, we have to. Do. I just wanted to make that point for the public. It, I, no, I, sometimes when you take a vote, it looks like we're making a choice. To me, this isn't a choice. It's a, it's a mandate. Right. And I, just yes. one I mean, in the context of the presentation we just heard, nearly half of the um, newly hired professional employees are special education. That's just from looking at titles. Mm -hmm. And then the new positions, um, three, about three-fifths of the FTEs of the new positions are happen to also be help support special education. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this is a, um, obviously, you know, something that we, it's, it, it's not expected, given that you see that, it's not expected that we are making this kind of a transfer. I think it's, you know, how do we continue to keep improving how we predict and, and budget. Um, so. All those in favor of the motion? Five zero. Five zero. Um, move to approve the transfer of fifty thousand to the administration cost center from regular day. Second. 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 Question. Yes. This is this is one where I feel like I need more information to vote for, but I'm not opposed to the concepts. I just feel if I could understand the breakout of the that you already have of the tax annuities versus the added hours versus anything else that goes into this, given that it's not a legal mandate to media IEPs here, I would need that information and that would be helpful to me. The, um, the TSA piece is contractual, just so you're aware. No, I said just the relative amounts that would be yeah. helpful for me, but I'll, we don't have that at this time. So, thank well, you. Is, it, is it in the memo? Or is it, it is not in the memo. I can say that the Additional amounts for the tax sheltered annuity is about $8,100 of that amount. We are increasing the employee physicals by approximately $4,000, which we're gauging based upon prior history would be. And then the differential between those two would be what we're looking for to do. assist the director of finance. So and that is we need to go out, we're looking at a host of different, whether it's overtime, whether it's retired business officers, so it's sort of, that's it's like a number 35, that. like 35,000 yeah. or right. so. so about for, the, for half of the right. year, which would be in line with what, a half of a full-time. Right. right, so that 49,000 is about 12,000 to cover the, uh, the employee savings plan mm -hmm. that's contractual, it's but contractual. we have to support the plan, yeah. and physicals, which is also contractual it's, and it's mandated by the town. mandated by the town in um, order to bring in the And then that, uh, that balance, that 35 or so, 37, is to, to provide funding in the, in the uh, manner of temporary support for the business office and director of finance. Correct. So I'm Does not sure if that works. Not, not totally. The, um, 
And again, that's cost against future projections. So again, we, we have money that we're projected to spend. We don't know whether those projections will be 100% accurate or not. Okay. Yes. I guess I know I keep hearing I am listening, and I know that that $37,000 we're looking to figure out the temporary support that we need. I guess I would just say when we're looking towards that, if we're going to train someone to do what needs to be done, to have a mind towards the possibility that we will be looking for someone down the road, so the possibility that we won't need to retrain someone twice. Just to have it in mind when we're looking at the potential uh, pool of candidates. Is this, I, is this position going to require an extensive amount of training? Or? What we're looking to do in the current year are items that we can relatively easier transition so it might be some of sort of the quarterly filings as we go into some of the other items that are coming up later in the year to help prepare some of the spreadsheets and schedules that will be needed so some of it is if they have a good Excel background it will be utilizing those skills not necessarily training them how to do an end of year report so we are being very selective in the items that we would have this person assist with over the next and Excel would be what they walk in the door with yes that. yes yes I just I wanted to share that I'm I'm gleaning I'm comfortable supporting this because I think in the past I've been on the committee four years I've seen two different trends happening and they're they're contradictory and I think create some tension one is that there used to be an assistant position right. so when I joined the committee this there was a human being who was providing all the support and in our correct desire to keep teachers in the classroom in class sizes and student facing positions that position has been the, the victim of budget the budget situation so at the same time that's happening the level of detail and that this committee and, and it's a good thing. We want more transparency. The, the, I personally feel the quality of the memos you've provided in the last year are phenomenal. And I think they're very helpful. I, I know for a fact people in the public read them and say, boy, that always concerned me, but now I see what it was. I think that's great. I think it's good for public trust in the schools. I think it's good for support in the community. Um, but it clearly takes work. So at the same time we've reduced the resources needed to do the work, I feel like the request, the demand for the work has increased. So that's just my perspective on what I've seen over the last four years. And, um, mm -hmm. I think it's a reality we have to face. Yeah. Um, it was, the motion was made and seconded. I'm not sure if did that address. At it's, least it's, it's helpful. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still <laughs> of the, I, I'm still of the view that the, the missing information that I requested would, would be very helpful for me to assess exactly so what doesn't appear here is the 35k or whatever the exact amount of support that's needed and I think that's helpful as a future benchmark just so that we can make informed decisions about for the level of service we're receiving both to like the six the five plus one eventually of us that this committee receives which is a very high level of service from from the administration and the public is receiving as a result too um, to get a sense of what the true cost of that is that's to me is it as clearly represented here as it might be in the line item of this just tells us that we need 50k to rebalance and 12k of this is physicals and retirement funds and then there's this other piece I'd like to see it more explicitly presented up we need another 35k or 37k and here's why but but you've answered the question but that's just where my gap is between where we are and where I would need to be well, well, but I, I think what you what you said was on an annual bait you'd be look to go out and look to hire an FTE you'd be talking probably, probably 60 65,000 65, yeah. and, so. and temporary help usually costs more than uh, uh, permanent help always does so that's that's what we're basing it on and it's really hourly wage and some of it could be overtime because if we use existing people they're going to go over the 40 hours mm -hmm. so we don't have an exact breakdown of that yet but this is you know our best estimate for the type of work that needs to be done. Understood. So, I, I just, it, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect though that if this is clarified subsequent, either in minutes or some other way, that it's not going to be substantially, substantially different from what we've just talked about, which is sort of the eight thousand and the twelve thousand, and you know thirty-seven thousand are sort of the pieces. Correct. Okay. 
Okay. Ready for the vote? Yeah. All those in favor? Opposed? Four, one. Bullying. So, uh, let's set, we'll do the uh, motion yes. first. Okay. first. Okay. Start the second reading. So, um, move to accept and approve the second reading of revised policy JICFB bullying prevention. Second. Second. Okay. Is there, did you want to make a break? So um, the last time, was it three weeks ago, I think? <laughs> so uh, Mr. Boyman brought up a question about a clause in the bullying prevent the actual bullying prevention plan that I did have legal counsel check. And um, you can see that Michael Joyce wrote a memo um, saying that that language was, um, that he would concur that removing that language is appropriate because it's not required by statute or regulation, so I have removed it from the bullying prevention plan. I also asked Mr. Joyce to go through the policy and the bullying prevention plan one more time to make sure there weren't any other changes to be made, um, and I gave you the red line copy of his changes so that you were aware that we, we are going to make a few changes um, to the plan that you originally saw in the previous packet. Um, but the policy itself right. is as is. That is right. not changed. So, and we do have two separate motions this evening. Just a procedural question. If we approve this. No, you don't need to approve the. That's not oh, true. The okay, not, we just have the. You're not Jean, approving Jean, the bullying. Jean had a question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to ask a procedural question. We approved the first reading. Now we're making changes. We're approving the second reading. We can do this tonight, right? We don't yes. have to restart at a first. You're reading. actually not making any changes to the policy. You're What's only approving the, the policy. Oh, the plan is what we were discussing last right. time. Right. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. So, okay. But that, that motion that's listed there, Elaine, we is don't not, need. You don't need that. Got it. So it's just the policy. Yep. So, uh, no changes made. Is it so ready for a vote? Yeah. I have a question, and maybe I'm co confused. Our policy says and defines target. Later on in the plan, it talks about victim. Do we want our language to be? The, the language that you see there is consistent. We've had our legal counsel review it. And it follows the law. OK, so in our plan also, it's target, not victim. Because I thought I remembered seeing victim. I was uh, just attorney, looking Attorney for the Joyce page. reviewed this again, and so. It's in the definition of. Yeah. yeah of the target does say victim. No, I know it is, but they use victim as the primary word. The, it would be victim in quotes, not target in quotes later on. It, you, I think we need to look at that separately, and if they're defined, as long as the definitions right. are defined, right, then. The, both documents are, will work together, and that it sounds like that's what Attorney Joyce also looked at. I should find the page. Plan we're not, we do not vote on. Right, right. So that that would be where the different language is, so that we don't have to resolve now. Well, we do vote. Because it on. was in the plan that I saw. Vote on the policy. You don't. You only you vote, vote on the policy. On the policy. Well, I got a motion to. I know that you don't vote on the plan. That's why the policy changes are being made. So why don't we start the reading? Um, you want to start it and we'll stop it? 
um, the Reading Public Schools endeavors mm -hmm. to maintain a safe Chair, learning. Yeah. Move to dispense with further reading of the policy. Yeah. Okay. And we have the motion on the table. Does everyone agree with that? Yes. Five yes. zero. So we have a motion uh, on the table to accept and approve the second reading of revised policy JICFB. Need a second? We already got a second. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's 10 o'clock. <laughs> sure. So I just have a question. Are, are the terms that are defined in the policy all also defined in the plan? The so last time we talked about bullying, and now that's the statutory definition in both places. So we've, we've, we've clarified the answer to my question for that one. But for all these others, and I guess my question is, do we want yes. to independently define some terms in the plan in our policy? If the plan changes, do we have to update the policy to synchronize with the you, you do not have to update the policy if the plan changes. That's why the policy is now written the way it is. But the policy has a lot of definitions, right? Cyberbullying, aggressor, retaliation, target. The, the only time you have to re-vote on the policy is when the law changes. Because your policy reflects the law. Are there any differences in defined terms now between this policy we're doing the second reading of tonight and the plan? In other it, words, is there any it, difference for a defined It should not term? be. But wouldn't the plan always have to defer? I mean, it's like sort of the order. You have the state statutes and the policy and then the plan. The plan, it should, would have to defer to the policy or it has to, it should, it's consistent with the policy so I don't know that there's a list the of policy the policy follows the law right. the law says that we have to have a bullying prevention plan right and right. this is and the that's plan. that's and, and you have the plan mm -hmm. the plan can be changed if you remember last time I gave you a letter from attorney Joyce on why we're making this shift so the plan allows us to administratively change it without going through the process of having right. school committee yeah. votes so that we can keep up with changes that may be happening at the state level. Not necessarily attached to the law, but with that DESE is requiring or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I did find where I was talking about in um, the the lawyers let the attorney's letter if you look at the definition the BPIP had initially defined bullying as follows and there it talks about the victim not the target that's what was taken out right, right. that's had initially yeah yes that so that's already been yeah. Yeah. fixed okay thank you so if I look at page 19 of the plan and I look at page 2 of the policy the definitions are different so target I mean, they, they're similar, but they're different. Isn't that aggressor? The red line? Aggressor is defined differently. Cyberbullying looks, I can't quite tell if it's the same or not. I'd have to read every word of it. It looks similar. So if, if, these, are, if these definitions are just being ported over from General Law Chapter 71, Section 37.0, can't we just cite to it in the policy instead of paraphrasing? In, oh, you mean in the plan? Yeah, I mean, if these have, are statutory definitions, I have to check whether that's the case. Why, at a minimum, why do we have a definition in a policy that is different than a definition in the plan to which the policy points? I'm not saying they're inconsistent, they're just different. And there may be instances that you could think of where an aggressor or retaliation or target or cyberbullying could meet one definition but not the other so why not have them the same I will I will I would can confer with attorney Joyce again I he had reviewed this now this is his third time just look I can look up in five seconds of on my phone I, I know I but I have to have here. legal counsel okay. review this I, I, I can't have well, I, I need to be comfortable to vote for a policy to know that it's consistent with the law. 
Well, Can I ask if the inconsistencies are material? I don't know. Because I, I but mean, they're just, not the same. Okay. Well, but there's there's the cyberbullying is defined. He he wrote defined. the policy and he reviewed the bullying prevention plan and re, and it does it doesn't made seem, the changes. It doesn't seem difficult to me if you're going to define a term in a policy and you're going to have a defined that same term defined with different the different definition in the plan. And the statutes defined at least some of these terms, if not all of them. Why not just use the language of the statute, cite to it, and be done with it? But are, are we sure that I can I can certainly have way? Attorney Joyce review it, it, and I can try to get an answer for next Thank week. You. Yeah. I'm just wondering if it isn't also a complaint because the definitions. Well, are I mean, but the definition of aggressor in the plan is much shorter than what's in the policy. So but cyberbullying is consistent, it appears. And that's what jumped out at me. Cyberbullying isn't it's included in one, it is included in another. But then if you read earlier, I can't remember if it's a policy or plan, bullying includes cyberbullying. So yes, it's not laid out, but it's covered that. somewhere else. So yeah. again, I mean, if it's a material difference, I certainly think it's important. But if it's just covered in a I different think, place. Well, you know, I'll give you an example that I think could matter. Aggressor is a person who engages in bullying. Okay, I understand what that means. It's a person. Sorry, Everything else is behavior. It doesn't matter who you are. Your employment doesn't matter. If you're bullying, if you're being an aggressor, you're being an aggressor. It doesn't matter who you are. It's based on your behavior. Okay. If you go to the policy, it has mm -hmm. to be a student or member of a school staff. Not limited to? Okay. Yeah, but that's, okay. that's yeah, not limited to. But, okay. but it's got to be a member of the school staff. So if someone is not a member of the school staff or a student, they cannot be an aggressor under our policy, but they can be an aggressor under the plan. So that's the kind of situation and confusion that I'd like to avoid. Well, yeah, that's the example I just used. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And to Gene, to, to Ms. Borowski's point about is it material, I, I really think that could be material. I mean, what would you do if you have, you have someone who who's meets the definition of aggressor under the plan but not under the policy? I'm not comfortable with that. So we can check. I will have Attorney Joyce look at it. I'll try to get an answer for next week. So do we need to? We had a motion on the table to take a vote. You suspend the vote. Yeah. All right. So we'll suspend the vote until we clarify basically those definitions. Yep. And it looks like cyberbullying is the same, but aggressive target and victim. No, well, victim. Table. It's not in Yep. Adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Five zero. Did you you raise your hand? What would happen I if we all voted against? <laughs> you did. Yeah. No, I didn't, but I do want to adjourn. You weren't hoping to be all voted.